Battleships are from a bygone era, where men were men and lobbed high-explosive shells at each other instead of hiding behind computer screens and turning war into a video game. So why would the US want to bring these relics of war back? To be fair, the battleship may have once ruled the seas, but the inherent limitations of ballistic artillery made them obsolete first. With the wide adoption of the aircraft carrier and with the final nail in the coffin being the perfection of the anti-ship missile. When it comes to missiles and a battleship's main guns, there's just no comparison. Most anti-ship missiles pack less explosive power than the big 16-inch guns of an old US battleship, but they make up for that lost firepower with extreme precision. Even with modernization upgrades done to the USS Iowa, America's last battleship to ever see combat, getting shells on target was more of a game of good enough than actual precision. On the other hand, a missile will strike exactly where it can do the most damage, making it an obvious upgrade for dumb artillery. But is it an upgrade? As war evolves, the US Navy has discovered a pressing need to take a significant step backwards, maybe even back to the age of the battleship, and it all has to do with the evolving technological capabilities of adversaries like China. But why did arguably the most awesome ships ever to be created really go extinct in the first place, and why couldn't we have just kept upgrading them to remain viable through the missile age? Historians argue about when the age of the battleship truly started, but from our point of view, the moment someone realized they could put a big gun on a boat and shoot other boats with it, the battleship was born. It wasn't until the late 1880s, though, that the term battleship was used in the modern context, when it was used to describe a growing fleet of ironclad warships. Today, they're known as pre-dreadnought battleships, but back in the day, they cut an imposing figure. When most ships still utilize sails, ironclads featured hulking plates of armor, large guns with more in common with field artillery than traditional ship cannons, and steam power. Sliding right on past the fact that we all took the blue pill on the whole steel floats now thing, dreadnoughts became the premier form of naval firepower by the 1900s and were used as a measure of a nation's might. They were today's supercarriers, extremely expensive to build and operate, and you absolutely did not want one showing up off your coast one day. The number of battleships a nation had directly impacted international diplomacy, as in, I have more battleships than you, so you do what I say. These ships were so powerful that they prompted the first modern arms race, leading to a series of naval treaties to limit how many battleships each nation could have. Despite its official obsolescence still being decades away, the Battle of Jutland in 1916 was the last naval engagement where battleships were used as the primary combatants. In fact, the actual usefulness of battleships was being questioned even during their heyday. Sure, they were impressive and certainly intimidating weapons of war, but these big ships rarely proved decisive in naval engagements. Rather, smaller, more agile ships were often the deciding factor. To make matters worse, the growing proliferation of things like torpedoes and naval mines increased the vulnerability of these hulking behemoths, to the point that by 1920, many were asking if it was even worth it to continue spending vast sums of money building and maintaining these huge ships. In World War II, the battleship's disputed reign as King of the Seas came to a decisive end thanks to the aircraft carrier and its ability to launch more and more advanced and capable aircraft. Now a carrier could send out swarms of dive and torpedo bombers that were far more accurate than any battleships, nimbler, and they had greater range. They were also cheaper to build and maintain. Shortly after the war, navies around the world began to decommission their surviving battleships. The time of the aircraft carrier had arrived. Despite this, the United States maintained several battleships in its reserve fleets, ready to be reactivated in case of emergency. During the Korean and Vietnam Wars, the US would reactivate battleships to provide naval gunfire support, with the last combat tour of a US battleship taking place during Desert Storm with the USS Iowa. By 1964, though, all but four of those mighty ships had been stricken from the registry and sent to be scrapped or sunk. And the US kept these four battleships ready for combat long after other nations had gotten rid of theirs. It wasn't really the Navy's choice, though, but rather Congress, which mandated that the Navy should maintain the big armored ships ready in case of war to provide fire support. In the aftermath of Vietnam, the United States saw a buildup of Soviet naval and air force, prompting President Ronald Reagan to propose that the Navy should be grown to 600 ships. As part of this naval buildup, the four remaining battleships underwent modernization upgrades. However, when the US won the Cold War Global Championship belt, this huge navy suddenly had no strong enough opponent to oppose it, and plans to scrap all the remaining battleships were made. Congress intervened, however, forcing the navy to maintain two battleships ready for combat at all time. 
Their chief concern was providing adequate fire support for marine amphibious operations, and until the Navy convinced Congress it could provide that support through conventional means, it was forced to spend money keeping the USS New Jersey and Wisconsin ready for combat. They remained combat ready into the 2000s for one key reason. When it comes to battleships, one thing sets them apart from modern crafts, firepower, and the amount of pain a battleship can bring is not easily matched even with modern weapons. The USS Iowa, the last US battleship to ever see combat in Desert Storm, was equipped with nine 16-inch guns, which it could fire once every 30 to 40 seconds, and 12 5-inch guns with faster rates of fire. After modernization upgrades, it was also equipped with 32 Tomahawk cruise missiles as well as 16 Harpoon anti-ship missiles. She was the best of both worlds, but it was those big 16-inch guns that prompted Congress to keep two battleships ready for combat well past their retirement age. The main concern plaguing military planners recently has been providing adequate firepower during a contested amphibious operation. And while missiles and aircraft are nice, they have significant limitations limitations which have reared their ugly heads again and now have the US Navy reconsidering the need for the big guns once more. Both missiles and aircraft can deliver precision firepower to hit the enemy exactly where it hurts most, a capability that even guided artillery shells can have difficulty reliably executing. They are also far more flexible tools than artillery and have greatly extended range. A modern cruise missile can fly for hundreds of miles before striking its target while a battleship typically has a range of 24 miles, well inside the threat envelope of modern anti-ship weapons. Both missiles and aircraft are expensive, though, and as the Ukraine war has shown, modern conventional war chews through inventory at a truly terrifying rate. A US precision bomb, the Joint Direct Attack Munition, can run between $21,000 to $36,000 per unit, and that is not the cost of the bomb, but rather the strap-on kit that's added to a dumb bomb to make it smart. Each dumb bomb can cost several thousand dollars on top of that. Meanwhile, a Tomahawk cruise missile will set you back about two million bucks for the latest and most advanced model. Each salvo of Tomahawk strikes is like throwing two dozen suburban homes at the enemy, because we live in an absolute nuthouse of a world. The cost of a modern 5-inch shell used aboard guns across the US surface fleet, though, is only a few hundred dollars, and that price point is becoming incredibly attractive to Navy leadership. After seeing the blistering rate of weapon consumption in Ukraine, the US has realized that, first of all, its existing stockpiles are not realistically deep enough for a prolonged conflict, and second, in any confrontation against the second richest nation on Earth, China, the US would find itself hard-pressed to outspend it in a near-peer conflict. Rather than hurling three-bedroom, two-bath homes at the target, a capable five-inch gun could deliver the same amount of pain for a few hundred bucks instead. But there are other reasons why big naval guns are becoming the talk of the town again, and that has to do with technology. As naval technology advances, the Navy is finding out that the best way to beat the future tech is to go retro. The problem with modern weapons is that they're so smart, they rely on sophisticated sensors and a network of assets to hit their target. And those sensors and networks can all be attacked directly or indirectly. It's known as a kill chain. And it's the reason why the US is pretty confident that despite China's vast arsenal of anti-ship ballistic missiles, it's still a safe bet to spend billions on supercarriers. By knocking out a node or two in a kill chain, you can bring the entire thing down and render an enemy's weapons useless, or at least force them to employ them in ways that make their delivery platform vulnerable. The US has invested heavily in redundancy to the point that its kill chains are now termed kill networks, but these can still be vulnerable to attack. A kinetic attack could physically destroy observation and reconnaissance assets needed to locate and track targets, while electromagnetic warfare could interrupt data transmission or mess with an incoming munition or the plane's sensors. Cyber attacks could corrupt a kill chain and make it inoperable, or even worse, ineffective, thus wasting any munitions fired while the kill chain is disabled. The beauty of a big ol' 16-inch shell is that it's impossible to hack. Precision-guided shells rely on GPS to strike their targets, but even if you interrupt the signal, you still got a significant amount of explosives screaming through the air and inbound on your general location. With enough of them being delivered in short order, accuracy becomes redundant. So rather than using expensive missiles to complete this saturation attack, why not use dumb munitions that will end up costing a taxpayer a fraction of what the smart option would? Shells can also take up significantly less room than aircraft or missiles. The Iowa-class battleships carried 1,200 rounds for their 16-inch guns, 
By comparison, a guided missile destroyer will typically carry about 90 to 96 missiles, though some can be quad-packed, and not all are meant for anti-ship or ground attack purposes. The sheer number of rounds a battleship could carry versus their contemporaries is yet another reason they remained attractive for so long. This was precisely the thinking of the US Congress in the early 2000s, as it pressured the Navy to come up with a better way to provide fire support for amphibious operations than simply relying on aircraft or missiles. While using naval guns for this purpose would put the ship in more danger by forcing it to be closer to the action, there's yet to be an alternative to the sheer volume of fire that its massive guns can provide. Faced with this complex problem, the Navy is set to work developing what it would call extended range guided munitions for their 5 inch guns. These projectiles would have a range of 40 nautical miles and be precision guided, but ultimately the program was cancelled in 2008 due to poor results. A sister program, the Ballistic Trajectory Extended Range Munition, would meet a similar fate, also being cancelled that same year. Back in 1994, though, the Navy had initiated a program to fulfill the need for naval fire support. The DDX program would evolve into the Zumwalt Destroyer program, which would carry the brand new advanced gun system and sport the fancy long-range land attack projectiles. These rocket-assisted shells would reach out and deliver democracy to someone as far away as 60 miles, and unlike other projectile programs, it actually worked pretty well. The Zumwalt, however, was doomed almost from the start, along with its fancy new gun and projectile. As more funding poured into the program, the Navy cut a planned order of 32 down to 24. Then, as concerns began to reverberate across Washington that the Zumwalt was sucking up funds from other priority programs, that order was further cut down to seven. Eventually, it would only result in the acquisition of three ships of its class, at a staggering cost. The Zumwalt is an impressive design, including stealth features that reduce its radar signature to that of a small fishing vessel. Its advanced gun system combined with the long-range land attack projectile could put precision pain on targets at a range that kept the ship an acceptable range from potential threats, and it could do so cheaply, at least until the cancellation of the program drove the cost of each individual shell to over a million dollars. Without the benefits of economy of scale, slashing the total number of hulls the Navy would acquire skyrocketed the cost of the long-range land attack projectile, which only the Zumwalt could fire. However, the ship was deemed too expensive given its capabilities and potential vulnerability. The Zumwalt couldn't fire RIM standard missiles and thus couldn't provide adequate air defense coverage for US fleets. An enemy attack missile might leave a Zumwalt unharmed, believing it to be a harmless fishing vessel, but that wouldn't matter as much when the rest of its accompanying fleet is sunk instead. There was also significant concern that the Zumwalt was not well suited to a specific threat that remains classified today. The Navy instead believed existing Arleigh Burke destroyers were better suited for this mysterious threat. With no projectile, the Zumwalt's fancy advanced gun system is literally useless, a fun little expenditure of several billion dollars total in research and procurement costs that is currently being torn off the decks of three existing Zumwalts and turned into scrap. However, the problem of naval gun support is still one that a growing part of the US Navy believes needs addressing. Currently, the Navy utilizes a 5-inch cannon as a backup armament and against small boats, but this isn't enough to provide adequate fire support in an environment that is being electronically denied or where aircraft are under significant threat, which perfectly describes what a war with China in the Pacific would look like. To fix this problem, in 1996, the Navy proposed a simple but brilliant solution. If volume was the biggest concern, why not just put more missiles on a ship? The Arsenal ship program was aimed at producing ships with as many as 500 vertical launch cells, and the Navy believed each ship would only cost about $450 million. However, Congress would wind up cutting funding for the program. Instead, the Navy ended up modifying four of its oldest Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines, replacing launch tubes that previously held the Trident nuclear missiles with tubes capable of launching the Tomahawk cruise missile. Each of these four submarines carries 154 Tomahawks and has the benefit of being completely submerged and thus very difficult to locate and destroy. In 2013, though, the idea was resurrected in response to the rising threat of China. Huntington Ingalls Industries proposed modifying the San Antonio class of amphibious transport docks into arsenal ships, which could carry 288 vertical launch cells. These ships would tag along with the rest of the fleet and provide a mix of air and ballistic missile defense, as well as precision strike capabilities. The idea was never followed through on, but recently there has been renewed interest with one additional feature being focused on, 
an arsenal ship that's fully automated. With the Navy admitting it cannot keep pace with the Chinese Navy in the Pacific due to its global commitments, it's focused on developing unmanned surface and subsurface platforms. Currently, the Navy is still experimenting with what roles these unmanned vessels are best suited for, but one is very obvious, being used as a missile truck. An unmanned arsenal ship would be cheap to operate given it would have no crew, and it could be built to be fully or even partially submersible to improve its defense. These ships would tag along with a surface action group or a carrier strike group and lend their firepower to the fight, using battle links to strike at targets or intercept incoming threats. While it's unlikely we'll see a return of giant battleships, one thing is clear, naval artillery is not dead, and there's no telling what new form it might take in an increasingly denied environment, where good old dumb weapons might be the most effective yet. Looming over the horizon, the nearly 60,000 tons of American diplomacy waits menacingly as the enemy aircraft approach. The pilots are stunned. They can't believe they've made it this far without being spotted. As they get closer and closer to their target, they make their missiles ready to fire and wait until they're sure they can hit their target. With the American supercarrier unusually quiet, the pilots let go their deadly payload and peel away. As they head back toward the base, they can see that their missiles hit the carrier but did not even cause a scratch. Disappointed, but not undeterred, other units join the fight to try and take it out. Next up is a destroyer that launches a surface-to-surface -surface missile at the carrier. It too hits, but it causes little damage to the integrity of the carrier. Lastly, a submarine tries its luck by launching torpedoes at it. Torpedoes are known to snap ships in half with just one shot, and with several on its way, surely the carrier must go down now. But to the submariner's dismay, even with all direct hits, the American behemoth still floats. While this scene might sound like wishful thinking or something out of a cheap war movie, it actually happened in real life. The USS America was a Kitty Hawk-class aircraft carrier and holds the title of being the only supercarrier sunk, intentionally or in battle, in world history. After she was decommissioned in 1996, the carrier was slated to be destroyed in a live-fire testing for the up-and-coming Nimitz-class carriers. The reason why she was selected was because she was quite similar in design and make to the Nimitz-class carriers, and US Navy engineers wanted to see really how much punishment a ship like this could take. The results of the testing far exceeded any of their expectations. Over the course of four weeks, the America was pounded with missiles from aircraft and ships, as well as torpedoes from submarines. She definitely took some heavy damage, but due to her construction was still able to stay afloat by herself, even without a crew on board conducting damage control. In the end, Navy explosive specialists had to board her and place demolition charges in specific places in order to sink her, which they finally did on May 14, 2005. It's incredibly unlikely that a team of skilled saboteurs could ever board the US Navy carrier and sink it with timed explosives. But even against conventional threats, these behemoths of American diplomacy are pretty darn hard to take out. Here are 10 reasons why US Navy aircraft carriers are impossible to sink. Number 10. The F-18 Attack Aircraft What would an aircraft carrier be without their aircraft? After all, their carrier air wing is what gives them their ability to attack from hundreds of miles before enemy units can even get within firing range of the carrier. There are three main aircraft that make up carrier air wings, and the F-18 Super Hornet is the strike warfare side of the house. The F-18 is the workhorse of the air wing, and each carrier can have up to about 50 of these aircraft on board. They are an all-purpose fighter that can combat targets in the air and on the ground. With their speed and maneuverability, they can easily outrun most combat aircraft in the world today. Though they have limited history in proving their air-to-air -air prowess with just two kills in the Gulf War, they've seen extensive use against ground targets in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Because of this, the F-18 is more than capable of knocking out enemy aircraft and shore installations hundreds of miles before they even become a threat to the carrier. Number 9. Link 16 US and NATO units use what are called tactical data links to share information. Though most NATO units only have Link 11, US forces are all equipped with the newest and most secure data link called Link 16. Broken down in its most basic form, tactical data links are simply a secure way to share information. By utilizing a variety of measures like frequency hopping and encryption, the data can be near impervious to enemy attempts to intercept or disrupt the information flow thereby guaranteeing the free flow of communications. In a real-world scenario, the carrier would be able to link up with the entire strike group and as many other units as the carrier wanted, thereby ensuring all units would have secure comms and a means of feeding information quickly in a real-world scenario. Number 8. The Skiff 
Going along the lines of secure information, on board every carrier is what's called a SCIF, which stands for Secure Compartmentalized Information Space. These spaces are top secret, and only those with extensive security background investigations and a need to know are allowed to enter. While the equipment inside is highly classified, SCIFs are an incredibly useful tool in that they allow processing and dissemination of vital information quickly. The information that could be received could be intel about an upcoming strike, indications and warnings of a terrorist attack, or anything else that would be of national security interest or pose an imminent danger to the carrier. Because other small ships like destroyers and cruisers do not have a skiff, the carrier becomes crucial as a means for getting vital information quickly and securely. Because of this, even if an enemy was planning an attack, the carrier would be forewarned about it. Number 7. Their Personal Defense Systems All warships are equipped with a robust line of defenses that when all other measures fail and a ship must stand on their own, she can still counter an attack. Carriers are no different. They have a variety of active and passive countermeasures on board that can be their last line of defense should an enemy threat ever get through. The most dangerous threat a carrier would face would be an enemy missile. For this, carriers have multiple Sea Sparrow or rolling airframe missiles designed to take out enemy missiles as a last resort before they strike the carrier. They are also armed with a close-in weapon system designed to shoot 20mm tungsten-tipped rounds at a rate of thousands of rounds a minute. The Sea Whiz also can be fired in surface mode against small contacts like skiffs or suicide boats. For subsurface threats, carriers can employ active countermeasures known as Nixie. Nixie is a towed array that can be fired with acoustic buoys that attract torpedoes away from the carrier and toward it. Lastly, the carrier can pick up and fight against attacks along the electromagnetic spectrum with its Slick 32. The Slick 32 is a powerful piece of equipment that can operate passively and actively against enemy threats like jamming. Number 6. The EA-18 Growler The EA-18 Growler is a modified version of the FA-18 Hornet in that it has advanced electronic warfare suites on board to counter a variety of threats. Its primary mission is the suppression of enemy radar defenses, and it does this in two ways. The first way is called passive countermeasures, whereby it can pick up electromagnetic frequencies from enemy radars and pass that information along about their bearing and range to the carrier or other units. If needed, the Growler can then take out the threats itself through active measures by launching a missile at the radars. Because of this aircraft, carriers can feel relative comfort from the threat that anti-ship missiles and even ICBMs pose, since without fire control radars to find and track a target, the missiles are essentially high-priced junk. Number 5. Their Escorts Carriers are never alone, and they always deploy with escort ships. This combination of ships is then called a carrier strike group. Within each strike group, there's typically one carrier, three destroyers, one cruiser, and a submarine. Though in today's operations, escorts may peel off to conduct other taskings. In a scenario where the strike group would be under a real threat of attack, all the escorts would return to be within range to protect the carrier. As grim as it sounds, the escorts, especially the destroyers, would act more or less as a bullet sponge for the carrier in an actual battle. This is because, though the goal of a destroyer is to take out missiles well before they reach their target, in the end if it came down to trying to save a carrier by losing a single destroyer, commanders would make that difficult decision only to save as many lives as possible. But don't worry, since though cruisers and destroyers may seem expendable, they're all in reality highly capable ships and even taking down one of these ships would be a challenge for any major power in the world. Number 4. Compartmentalization On board a vessel, there are not just a couple floors and a few dozen compartments. Rather, even a smaller ship like a destroyer will have about 10 decks and hundreds of spaces, while a carrier will have a dozen decks and thousands of spaces. This large number of spaces is crucial, since it means that even if some spaces are lost due to damage or flooding, they can be sealed off and the ship can continue fighting. Another benefit of all these spaces is what's called cross-flooding. Cross-flooding is whereby perfectly good spaces are intentionally flooded out. This is usually done as a way to manage the stability of a vessel. Because of this, even if large numbers of spaces are lost or flooded, the ship will not lose mission capability and definitely will not sink easily. Number 3. The E-2D Hawkeye the most advanced and top secret aircraft on board a carrier, the E-2D Hawkeye is the eyes and ears of a carrier air wing. It's also its number one intelligence gathering asset. With a huge radar dome on top of the aircraft, the plane can coordinate strikes of all the other aircraft already in the air. Additionally, with the combined engagement concept, 
It can congregate data from other aircraft to help the carrier form an accurate and real-time picture of the battle space. The onboard sensors are also quite powerful in picking up enemy missile radars, surface search radar, and other electromagnetic signals that can be sent back to the carrier. Because of all these functions, it's unlikely that any enemy aircraft, surface contact, or missile will get close undetected. Number 2. Their Redundancy Carriers are just like any other warship in that redundancy is built into the system. Take for example the electrical system. There are numerous electrical generators on board an aircraft carrier, along with a port and starboard bus. Taking out just a few generators or even one of the electrical buses will not take power out of the ship. Another example would be its fire main system. Fire main is just seawater that's the primary method of attacking fires on the ship. The fire main loop, or how the water travels, is varied and full of twists and turns. That way, if the fire main loop is affected anywhere, it can be quickly isolated and water can still be directed toward a casualty. Number 1. Their speed The best defense an aircraft carrier has is its speed. Though the official stance is that they can go greater than 30 knots, in reality it's believed that they can go much faster than that. So fast, in fact, they could outrun practically every other warship on the planet at full power. Why speed matters is that if a carrier can move extremely quickly to avoid danger, then it's unlikely the threat will hit the carrier, whether it's a missile, torpedoes, or another ship. If the carrier cannot defend against it, then it can just run away. That's not to say that a carrier can go anywhere close to what a speeding missile can travel. Rather, a carrier can move so fast, so quickly, that the enemy's fire control solution will be outdated by the time the missile gets there, or that the seeker on the missile will have a greater difficulty in reacquiring the carrier. For missiles and torpedoes that are passive, moving out of the general area quickly would surely defeat most of those systems. Those were the top 10 reasons why an aircraft carrier cannot be sunk. Though extremely unlikely to be sunk by any singular threat, there are emerging technologies that seek to overthrow carrier dominance. One of the main ones is the threat of swarm attacks, either through drones, missiles, or suicide boats. With the prospect of facing hundreds of threats at once, this yet untested tactic is perhaps the only means to actually sink a carrier. But as of yet, the enemies of the United States have not tried such a method, and the US Navy has probably already come up with ways to counter such a threat if it were ever to face it on the battlefield. The British Army Special Air Force, aka SAS, began operations in 1941 during the Second World War. The reason for having such a specialized set of soldiers was to get behind enemy lines and attack them from within, or at least destroy what they could while gaining intelligence. It still takes part in operations that involve the United Kingdom, but as it's very much a covert special forces unit, much of what the SAS does is a secret. The Navy SEALs, Sea, Air, and Land Team, was formed much later when President John F. Kennedy established them in 1962 as a clandestine unit Unit which, like the SAS, would take on special missions much of the time in very hostile environments. They also act under a veil of secrecy and are sometimes referred to as America's secret warriors. If both these units are so secretive, then how does one get a job with them? Well, with the SAS, there is a small problem to begin with if you are a mere civilian. They won't allow you to apply. So to start with, you must already be in the British Armed Forces or be a soldier in the British Commonwealth. Another way to get in is to join the SAS reserves, and they do accept civilians. As long as you've passed the reserve training and worked with them at least 18 months, you can apply to work in the SAS proper. To apply for the SAS, you should be between 18 and 32 years of age and be in amazing physical and mental shape. You'll be required to do at least a three-year stretch. Women can apply, but have so far been excluded from most combat movements. To apply, you must accept that you know the harsh demands expected of you, people have died during training, and that means signing an Army General Administrative Instruction Form. You're basically acknowledging you are willing to go through hell. Next comes the medical, the battle fitness test, which will mean running fully kitted or squatted for one and a half miles in 15 minutes. Apparently 10% of applicants don't even make it past this point. That pace for even an average person in running shoes and shorts isn't too bad. Now you start your real training. To join the Navy SEALs, you need to be a natural born or naturalized American between the ages of 18 and 28, although at 17 you can join if your parents say it's okay. If you want to become an officer, you can be up to the age of 33. The first woman ever started the training in 2017, but dropped out soon after. You'll need to have a clean record, and many background checks will be done. You'll then undergo physical and mental tests, including an eye test to make sure you have under 2070 vision. As for what shape you must be in, well, you are going to go through hell with the SEALs, so they suggest you follow their Navy Special Warfare Physical Training Guide. This includes lots of long and short swims and runs, lots of interval training, as well as other workouts. As for other strength training, their gym workouts basically tell you you'll have to be as strong as a bull as well as have all the cardio attributes. You'll be screened before you can start training, and that will mean you must show that you can run 1.5 miles in 11 minutes, but not squatted. 
This also comes after a 500 yard swim in 12 and a half minutes, 42 push ups, 50 sit ups, and 6 pull ups, all with a short rest in between. Once you actually start training with the SAS, the first phase lasts 4 weeks. This will test your endurance and ability to navigate through the wilderness, that being a harsh mountain range in Wales. In 2015, a young recruit died during this exercise just half a kilometer from the end. He died at the part nicknamed VW Valley, standing for Voluntary Withdrawal Valley. Two other soldiers died that day too, leading to an inquest into the treatment of soldiers. Some of the activities in the mountains included a 15 mile hike to start with. Those that can get through that then have to do a 40 mile hike carrying a 55 pound backpack, a rifle plus their food and water. They are not allowed to use any established trails but they do have a map and a compass. After that, they can rest a bit and start the weapons training phase as well as do parachute training. After that, there is six weeks of jungle training, usually in the rainforests of Belize, Borneo, or Brunei. The last phase is called escape and evasion, which will mean being forced into some horrible survival scenarios as well as learning how to handle being interrogated. This will include humiliations and other psychological harassment, as well as being blindfolded, deprived of sleep, given nothing to eat or drink, being put in stress positions, imprisoned in a small cage, and having to listen to loud noises all the time. SAS tough guy turned novelist said physical injuries finish a lot of people off during training, but you need a lot of strength of will to get through the psychological stuff. In 2016, the Washington Times reported that one Navy SEAL died in three out of the last four training classes. One was a drowning, another a suicide, and another a car crash after drinking heavily. The Post states that the six-month training will include a seven-day stretch of little sleep, self-induced hypothermia, and brutal physical conditioning known as Hell Week. It's Hell Week where most recruits drop out. The training in Colorado starts with five weeks of pre-training in class, get through that and you enter the realm of pain and indignity. The Navy SEALs website doesn't go into specifics, but states that you'll be tested to your limits of fatigue. This will include running through sand, swimming in oceans, sometimes in the middle of the night with your clothes on, rappelling down cliffs or buildings at speed, enduring cold and heat, getting lost and finding ways out, combat training, long distance underwater dives, weapons and explosives training, mission planning, tactics training, and more. Hell Week seems to be the worst part. One soldier described it as being designed to put you through 24-7 days of no rest and continual harassment. From his class of 300, only 19 completed the training. In all, it will last five and a half days and you'll almost continuously be pushed to your limits. You are allowed no more than about four hours sleep during the entire training. You'll also have to deal with integration in what's called the survival, evasion, resistance, and escape phase. Former SEAL Brandon Webb said it will involve sacks over your head, being beaten with sticks, and humiliation. It's here he said that some people lose their minds. At least after that you get some classroom time. For seven weeks you'll also have a land warfare phase as well as parachute training. If you pass it all, you'll be given the Navy SEAL tri but then have to do advanced training. This will include sniper, communications, and free fall parachute training. Once you are done, you'll have way more weapons to use than a regular soldier. In the SAS, this will include a C8 carbine assault rifle, an ultra compact individual weapon, an M16, an HK MP5 submachine gun, an HK417 sniper rifle, an AW50 anti material rifle, handguns, tear gas, canister launchers, stun grenades, rocket launchers, portable anti personnel mines, grenade launchers surface-to-air missiles, and many more things it will take too much time to talk about. You'll also, of course, get all the kit, including things like body armor. According to the Navy SEALs website, your regular SEAL on land will carry such things as the Colt Automatic Rifle 15, the M60 machine gun, M203 grenade launchers, a shotgun, an SASR 50 caliber sniper rifle, an M107 anti-material rifle, a Beretta M9 handgun, a 20mm Gatling gun, and AT4 rockets. Again, these are just some of the most used weapons as the list is endless. In recent years, China's aggressive expansion of its military presence on disputed South China Sea territories has highlighted for the nation's leadership the necessity for a blue water or ocean-going navy. As the cornerstone of any modern naval force, the Chinese turned their ambition towards developing a homegrown aircraft carrier. Now, nearly a decade after refitting a half-built former Soviet carrier as a test ship, the Chinese have recently put to sea their first indigenous aircraft carrier, the Type 001A. Meanwhile, the USA is simultaneously launching its newest model of aircraft carriers, the Ford class, as it finishes a three-year pivot of its naval forces to the South Pacific in preparation for a possible confrontation with an increasingly aggressive China. Today, we'll take a look at a potential showdown between two of the mightiest ships ever constructed in this episode of the Infographic Show, the Chinese Type 001A versus the US Ford class carrier. To determine a victor, the ships will go head to head in three key areas, crew, speed slash power, and armaments. 
China's navy is re-entering blue waters for the first time in over a century and faces a combat-proven United States Navy. But who would win in an all-out fight? A modern aircraft carrier is essentially a small, floating city, housing a crew of thousands who must flawlessly execute dangerous takeoff and landing operations 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in all weather conditions. In combat, crews can potentially be launching and recovering 240 aircraft a day, meaning that this small city must operate in perfect unison at all times, and all the while with hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of live bombs and jet fuel on or below the flight deck. Needless to say, crew expertise is a critical component of any aircraft carrier. The American Ford class is entering service into a navy with a rich aircraft carrier tradition. Both in its own wars and assisting allies or UN forces, the aircraft carrier has been the tip of American power for over 70 years, and its pilots and crews indubitably the most experienced in the world. During the height of carrier-based strikes during the invasions of both Iraq and Afghanistan, American carriers were generating sortie rates of more than 200 a day, an absolutely incredible feat of teamwork and expertise. The Chinese, meanwhile, have only now reached six years of aircraft carrier experience. For any new Navy, and especially its pilots, the task of operating and launching sorties from a carrier is a difficult and often painful one to master. Landing a 70,000-pound airplane atop a moving deck in the middle of the ocean is an incredibly difficult task for any airman, and Chinese pilots were not only learning how to do this for themselves, but actually designing the training program for future pilots simultaneously. Due to Chinese censorship, exact figures are impossible to verify, but it is clear by the leak of reports of ongoing accidents involving pilots both at sea and testing carrier technologies on dry land that the Chinese are finding the process of cutting their teeth on carrier operations to be as painful as any other nations. Another important factor, however, is the Chinese government's shaky faith in its own troops due to decades of corruption. As he assumed office in 2012, Chinese President Xi Jinping was warned by senior staff that they doubted China's ability to fight and win any war due to the prevalence of corrupt and incompetent military leadership. Xi would immediately launch a series of historic anti-corruption purges, announcing in 2016 that an incredible 1 million officials had been punished for corruption. Western observers note that corruption is still a major concern for Chinese leadership, and also point at a three times lowering of military recruitment standards as signs of questionable fitness from its service members. Still, the launching of the Type 001A clearly signals a Chinese Navy that's shaping up and literally shipping out. Shaking off the dark shadow of corruption and boldly stepping forward into its first carrier program, China is still unfortunately overwhelmingly outclassed by America's experience, giving the Ford class the advantage for crew expertise. Our next critical assessment of the two aircraft carriers lies in the area of speed. Aircraft carriers are the vanguards of a nation's naval forces and as such need to be fast enough to get to hotspots anywhere in the world quickly. Speed isn't just important for getting to warfronts quickly though, but also to make a carrier harder to detect and target. By staying in constant motion, an aircraft carrier is much harder to neutralize than an airfield, but can be just as big a threat. America has a long history of forward deploying its carriers around the world, and thus it's no surprise that speed was a big priority for the US Navy, with the Ford class displacing a whopping 100,000 tons and still reaching speeds in excess of 35 miles per hour. By comparison, the Type 001A is a lithe 70,000 tons and travels at 36 miles per hour. Slight, but the advantage would seemingly still go to the Type 001A, except for the reason why, though it is 30% lighter, the Type 001A is only 1 mile per hour faster than the Ford class. Nuclear Power the U.S. Nimitz class, which the Ford replaces, carries dual nuclear reactors capable of generating a combined 450 megawatts of electricity, but the 40-year-old design is incapable of generating enough power for modern systems. The Ford class was thus designed not only to operate modern power-hungry electronics, but with a projected service life of 90 years, its nuclear reactors can generate up to 700 megawatts, over 25% more than its Nimitz predecessors, and leaving plenty of juice for future Future weapons and upgrades. Though the Chinese Type 001A is faster by a hair, the Americans once more have the advantage courtesy of the Ford's dual A1B nuclear reactors and all the modern and future capabilities a Ford carrier can thus bring to bear. 
Crew, speed, and power are all important for any vessel. But what about the actual weapons both ships bring to bear against one another? Unlike any other combat vessel, an aircraft carrier is unique in that it is equipped with few, if any, long-range strike capabilities in the form of guns or missiles. Instead, they rely completely on the aircraft they launch for both offense and defense. Because our two carriers would never physically see each other in our hypothetical combat, we instead must look at the combat aircraft each brings to bear. China's Type 001A's exact air wing complement remains unconfirmed as the ship has only now entered sea trials and is yet years away from being operational. Analysts, however, have estimated that the Type 001A will carry either four more fixed wing aircraft or eight helicopters than the Type 001, bringing its air wing to 24 to 28 fighters and 17 to 25 helicopters. Once operational, the Type 001A will be equipped with the J-15 Flying Shark fighter jet. Denounced by Russia as a copy of their Sukhoi Su-33 fighter, the J-15 is indubitably heavily influenced by the Su-33, but features indigenously developed technologies, an important goal for Chinese military aviation. However, by China's own admission, the J-15's engines are not as powerful as either the Russian Su-33s or the American Super Hornets, requiring the Type 001A carrier to be equipped with a ramp-like ski jump to help get the plane into the air. Its weaker engines and need for a ski ramp for takeoff assist means that the J-15 cannot take off with as much fuel or weapons as an American plane, a critical vulnerability in carrier-on-carrier -carrier combat. By comparison, the American Ford class is predicted to field between 75 and 92 aircraft, potentially tripling its combat power versus the Chinese Type 001A. More important though is the configuration of the American Air Wing versus the Chinese Air Wing. A Ford class carrier will be equipped with stealthy F-35s, EA-18G Growler electronic attack jets, MQ-25 Stingray refueling and reconnaissance drones, and E-2D Hawkeye airborne early warning and control aircraft. The addition of electronic attack, airborne refueling, and early warning aircraft to the American Air Wing means that US jets will be able to fly further, for longer, and fire first on radar-jammed and blind Chinese fighters. In the combat calculus of armaments, it is a no-contest win for the United States who comes armed with triple the firepower and more sophisticated fighter and support aircraft. So who would win in a fight between the Chinese Type 001A and an American Ford-class carrier? The United States brings proven combat veterancy and decades of experience in both operating and building aircraft carriers. Its new Ford-class carriers are not only based on a proven design, but will come equipped with the world's first fifth-generation aircraft and have plenty of capability to adopt emerging technologies such as energy and railgun weapons. While a brave and very impressive start, the Chinese Type 001A is still just that, a start based on an obsolete design for a nation that for decades had no interest in aircraft carriers. Still, some critics argue that the Ford class is too ambitious and fields too many new technologies that have never been tested in combat. Should the worst come to pass and an American Ford carrier ever finds itself in combat versus China's Type 001A, the victor will almost certainly be the American ship. But who knows? Maybe somewhere deep within the American high-tech carrier lies a critical vulnerability that may spell doom for America's flagships. China's meteoric economic rise in the last three decades has seen the world's largest nation pick itself up from its agrarian roots to become a robust and modern economy. While not more powerful than the US economically, China's is the only economy in the world to truly rival the US's. Yet all of China's economic expansion has created a crippling national Achilles heel. Its overwhelming reliance on naval trade routes to export its trade goods and supply its ravenous appetite for oil. If China is to truly become a peer competitor to the US, it must secure and defend its access to the world's most important shipping lanes. In today's episode of the Infographic Show, we're taking a look at the Asian powerhouse and asking, is China ready to take on the US Navy? For decades, China focused primarily on maintaining national sovereignty by establishing a large ground force capable of fighting off another Japanese invasion or their former Soviet rivals. As China's economy expanded though, its reliance on maritime trade grew to a staggering disproportion. While every nation relies on maritime trade, China's economy depends on the sea for 60 to 80 percent of its imports and exports, and almost all of its oil supply. This has placed China in a precarious situation where it is uniquely vulnerable to disruption of those trade routes 
and forced a shift in focus from a ground army to a growing naval and air force. China's maritime strategic position is unique and completely stacked against it. With the bulk of its oil passing through the Indian Ocean, another of China's longtime rivals, India, is in a position to easily disrupt and even completely shut down Chinese shipping. While China maintains a larger and better equipped naval force than India, Indian ships would enjoy land-based support and quick resupply, while China would have to find a way to forward deploy a sizable battle group to the Indian Ocean that could fend off not just the Indian Navy, but the land-based Indian Air Force as well. Not only is this currently strategically impossible for the limited Chinese Navy, but China also lacks the supply and logistics ships needed to keep a task force out at sea for extended periods of time. War against the US would likely involve India as an American ally, but even if it didn't, China would still have to face America's formidable Pacific fleet. With 2,000 aircraft and 200 ships, to include 33 nuclear attack submarines, America's Pacific fleet alone is more than a match for China's entire navy, which numbers at 100 93 combat ships and 710 aircraft. In any conflict, the US Pacific Fleet would also quickly be augmented by other American naval forces. So could China hope to fend off the US Pacific Fleet in the event of war? In 1996, in response to the US granting a visa to Taiwan's President Li Teng Hui, China launched massive military exercises meant to intimidate Taiwan, beginning with live fire missile and artillery firing just kilometers from Taiwan's shores. This was followed by a widely publicized amphibious assault exercise meant to signal that China was ready and willing to cross the Taiwan Strait and invade the long independent island. In response, the United States deployed three aircraft carrier battle groups to the area and an amphibious assault ship, the largest display of American military might in Asia since Vietnam. This brief confrontation forced the Chinese to admit that they could not hope to stop the US from defending Taiwan, and internally, Chinese military leadership doubted the possibility of defeating the US Navy in any combat scenario. Humiliated by the US's response and their inability to prevent it, China reshuffled its military priorities, placing a much greater emphasis on its naval, missile, and air forces. Two decades later, their efforts have paid off in spades, with China boasting the largest ballistic missile force in the world and a competent, if still limited, navy. Yet China is still saddled with a great deal of internal issues, the most pressing being the systemic corruption that has for decades thrived amongst the Communist Party leadership and the armed forces both. Despite Xi Jinping's anti-corruption purges, the damage to China's military by a long legacy of corrupt and ineffective leadership could take years to reverse. China also faces a serious recruitment, training, and experience problem with its armed forces. Unable to meet military recruitment quotas, China's armed forces have been forced to lower their recruiting standards several times since 2010. This has resulted in a crop of recruits whose current capabilities are questionable to say the least. As noted by Chinese observers, in 2012, a People's Liberation Army unit became so stressed out in the midst of a 15-day wartime simulation that the ongoing exercise had to be put on pause and time taken out for movie nights and karaoke parties. By day nine of the exercise, a cultural performance troupe, PLA parlance for song and dance girls, had to be brought in to entertain the homesick soldiers whose morale had plummeted. Further reporting notes that this is likely not an isolated incident, and Chinese watchdogs have long observed that China engages in little comprehensive training of its troops in comparison with their Western counterparts. In fact, China's confidence in its own troops is so low that it was only in the early 2010s that Chinese units began to take part in UN peacekeeping deployments, long refusing to take part out of fear of international embarrassment. To further compound China's challenges in waging war against the US or another peer power, the nation has not fought a major conflict since a brief skirmish against Vietnam in 1979. The modern Chinese military has absolutely no experience in modern combined arms warfare, and to further compound China's problems, it also lacks a joint command structure amongst its various military branches like the US employs. This means that in war, it would be difficult to coordinate Chinese ground forces with their air forces or naval forces with their missile forces, etc. Given the fast pace and chaotic nature of modern war, this would leave China unable to quickly respond to and defend from threats. After the humiliation of the 1996 Taiwan Strait Crisis, China began to invest heavily into its missile forces with the goal of threatening
threatening American aircraft carriers from deep within the Chinese mainland. Maintaining the world's only missile service as a separate branch of its military, China's commitment to long-range standoff weapons is not to be underestimated. Yet despite boasting that its new DF-21 carrier killer ballistic missiles could shut the US out of the West Pacific, the truth behind these boasts is dubious at best. A ballistic missile strike on a moving target in the middle of the ocean requires a long and very complicated kill chain involving land-based radar, airborne radar, satellites, and command and control nodes to all coordinate tracking and targeting of an enemy ship, and to date, China has not displayed the capability to successfully execute every step in this complex kill chain or to protect the individual links from attack or interference. Yet even the most optimistic American naval commanders acknowledge the threat that China's ballistic missiles present to a carrier battle group, which is why the US has responded by engaging in the most ambitious ballistic missile defense program in its history, testing everything from airborne to ship-installed directed energy weapons such as lasers to a new generation of the standard model anti-air missile to classified anti-satellite weapons projects, the US has taken the Chinese ballistic missile threat very seriously. China's missile forces are its best tool for keeping the US Navy at bay, but unproven as they are, it's doubtful just how effective they would ultimately be. However, the one thing that China, and most people in the US, tend to forget about are the US's submarine forces, and that's no coincidence. Secretive by design, the US's Silent Service is the most advanced submarine force in the world, and it maintains a constant rotation of 18 subs forward deployed in the Pacific, with another 8 loitering in potential conflict zones. For the US Navy in the Pacific, this means Chinese coastal waters, and with China's very limited anti-submarine capabilities and notoriously noisy subs, this underwater force alone would be enough to choke China's trade completely and sink the entirety of China's very small amphibious assault fleet should it try to invade Taiwan. Immune to China's ballistic missile forces, America's nuclear attack submarines are its best weapon in any conflict against China, something both China and the US are keenly aware of. In response, China has installed underwater listening sensors across the South China Sea, and for its part, the US has increased annual production of its new Virginia-class submarines to two a year through to at least 2030. China is not yet ready to take on the US Navy and win, yet this is a deficiency it has clearly identified and is working to address with a huge expansion of its own Navy, the building of two aircraft carriers, and building new diesel-powered submarines. But with a looming population crisis set to explode a demographic time bomb by 2030, where over 65% of its population will be of retirement age, China may find itself pressed for the economic resources it needs to continue expanding its military. The US also faces challenges challenges in maintaining its global peacekeeping naval fleet, but with a strong network of alliances and access to financial networks China does not, it will take some serious and very focused investment in its navy, perhaps at the expense of its other branches, for China to ever truly challenge America in the open ocean. The US Navy, the world's most powerful fighting force on the surface, beneath the surface, and in the skies above the sea. The US Marines, tip of the spear of American military power. How do the two services compare to each other though? That's what we'll find out today in this episode of the Infographic Show, the US Navy versus the US Marines. The US Navy was officially established on October 13, 1775, when the Second Continental Congress passed a resolution creating the Continental Navy. Mostly a token force that met with little actual success during the American Revolutionary War, the Continental Navy was disbanded shortly after the war with its last ship auctioned off in 1785. Almost 10 years later, with threats to the New Republic's merchant shipping from North African Barbary pirates, first American President George Washington created the Naval Act of 1794, which created a permanent standing navy. Often forgotten by politicians, the navy would languish throughout the 1800s with outdated and few ship designs until the start of the 20th century, when by the end of World War I, the US Navy had more sailors and an equal number of capital ships as the vaunted British Royal Navy earning stunning victory after victory during World War II in the Pacific against the powerful Imperial Japanese Navy, the US Navy would go on to become the world's most powerful and important naval force. Although technically a detachment of the US Navy, 
the U.S. Marines traced their founding to a resolution passed by the Second Continental Congress on November 10th, 1775, ordering Captain Samuel Nicholas to raise two battalions of Marines capable of fighting both in ship-to-ship -ship battles and land actions. Also disbanded after the Revolutionary War, a need for a ship-borne fighting force arose towards the end of the 18th century as the fledgling U.S. prepared for the quasi-war with France waged exclusively on the high seas between 1798 and 1800. The U.S. Marines would come into their own during the War of 1812 against Britain, where during the Battle of New Orleans, they were directly credited with holding General and future President Andrew Jackson's center defensive line. Leading U.S. actions in the Pacific during World War II, American Marines would conduct an island-hopping campaign against entrenched Japanese forces, leading to the bloodiest and most violent battles of the Second World War. So, how do the two services compare? For starters, the U.S. Navy maintains an 8-week basic training course for new recruits, while Marine basic training lasts for 13 weeks. Navy basic training focuses on shipborne operations, with recruits undergoing classes in firefighting, ship-to-ship -ship communication, and ship and aircraft identification. Marine basic training, meanwhile, focuses on marksmanship, battlefield first aid, and combat tactics. This training focus directly reflects each service's mission statement, with the Navy's mission being to maintain, train, and equip combat-ready naval forces capable of winning wars, deterring aggression, and maintaining freedom of the seas. The Marines' mission, on the other hand, is to act as America's expeditionary force, forward deployed to win battles on land, sea, and air. In terms of size, the U.S. Navy has nearly 326,000 active duty personnel, with nearly 99,000 reservists. They operate a total of 480 ships and 2,600 aircraft. The Marines, on the other hand, are about half that size, with 182,000 active duty personnel and 38,500 reservists. Other than a few patrol craft, they operate none of their own ships and instead are attached to U.S. Navy vessels, but they do operate 1,300 aircraft. Marine aviation is split up into helicopter and fixed-wing attack aircraft squadrons. For helicopter-based close air support, forward air control, escort, and reconnaissance, the Marines are equipped with the AH-1W Super Cobra, AH-1Z Viper, and UH-1Y Venom Light Attack Helicopter. The AV-8B Harrier II Combat Jet gives the Marines the flexibility to provide close air support, air interdiction, and surveillance operations. As a jump jet design capable of short takeoff, vertical landing, or stovel operations from amphibious assault ships or remote rough airfields, the Harrier perfectly suits the Marine Corps expeditionary nature. Beginning in 2016, the Marines began replacing their vaunted Harriers with a stovel version of the F-35 Lightning II. To provide air superiority for their ground forces and to strike at surface targets, the U.S. Marines are equipped with the F-A-18 Hornet and now the F-35B Lightning II. In effect, the U.S. Marines are a ground combat force with their own air force, more than a match on their own for most other nations' militaries. The U.S. Navy has no attack helicopters, but does operate a large fleet of choppers for search and rescue, anti-submarine warfare, anti-mine countermeasures, and transport. To establish and maintain air superiority over a nation's coastal areas, and to defend U.S. forces at sea from enemy air attack, the Navy operates the F-A-18 and F-A-18EF Super Hornet. As multi-mission platforms, the Navy's Hornets and Super Hornets can also be tasked with strike missions against enemy land targets or ships. While the Navy is slowly phasing in the F-35C Lightning II, it does not plan to completely eliminate its fleet of Super Hornets and to date has a further 10 new Super Hornets on order. Tasked with ensuring free trade for all nations across the world's oceans, the U.S. Navy deploys very frequently. Sailors can be deployed between six and nine months at a time aboard a ship and return home for four to five months before deploying again. As an expeditionary force, Marines have to be constantly ready to deploy to anywhere the U.S. needs manpower fast, and their deployments can range from 30 days up to no longer than two years, depending on the state of global affairs and the threat or prosecution of an ongoing war. The U.S. Navy is the most powerful sea-based fighting force in history and ensures that nations around the world have free access to the open sea. American Marines have, for over two centuries, been the tip of American firepower, fighting in every climate and settled continent in the world. While their missions and equipment may differ, both services are indispensable arms of the U.S. military that work closely together to achieve victory. 
The year was 1943. The USA had been involved in World War II for a couple of years, and during that summer on the high seas, US destroyers and other Allied ships were involved in a bloody battle with German U-boat submarines. The Battle of the Atlantic would become the longest continuous military campaign of the war, and it would take thousands and thousands of lives belonging to the Allied forces and the German military. Shipyards in Britain, the US, and Canada were more than busy, but it was at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard where something special, something verging on the utterly fantastic, was supposedly taking place. This would become known as the Philadelphia Experiment, and now we're going to tell you how that allegedly went down. As the story goes, at that American shipyard in Philadelphia, a new destroyer was being built and it went by the name of the USS Eldridge. But this was no ordinary destroyer, far from it. It was being equipped with technology no country had or even had heard about. This technology was related to something called electrical field manipulation, and what this did was make the ship invisible to everyone else. This apparently came to fruition on July 22, 1943. We're told on this day in front of government and military officials, the scientists disappeared the ship with crew intact right in front of their eyes. A witness said he heard the generators buzz and then a strange blue light seemed to encapsulate the destroyer, and then, poof, it was gone. To say the least, the onlookers were completely baffled. To baffle them even more, their reports that the Eldridge appeared somewhere else at another shipyard in another part of the US and then reappeared back in Philadelphia. That's one story anyhow, because another story says those scientists didn't introduce teleportation until later that year in October. Some accounts even say that when the ship came back there were sailors on board, but some of them had been fused to various parts of the steel. Some of these people were apparently mangled and broken, which adds some amount of horror to the tale. Apparently, when the ship was teleported in the second experiment and just appeared in the water near the Philadelphia shipyard, someone saw it and he was aboard another ship, the SS Andrew Furst. Seth. It sounds like an outlandish tale, but a lot of people believe it's true. Now we must try and separate fact from fiction. So we'll introduce an astronomer and science fiction writer named Morris K. Jessup. Some reports said he'd been in touch with an anonymous person who had been on the Andrew Furseth, although later accounts say the writer was told about the experiments by a guy named Carl Meredith Allen. We can't tell you much about him, but he's been called a UFO conspiracy theorist and a publicity seeker. You can tell us if that's true at the end of the show. Jessup lived an embattled life. He was an educated man who became an astronomer, but his real love was writing books. He wrote some books on UFOs in the 1950s, notably his The Case for the UFO in 1955. This book did okay, and he believed he could make a living from writing. His second book didn't do well though, and subsequently his manuscripts that followed were rebuffed by his publisher. To make matters worse, his wife left him in 1958. A year later, he was depressed and despondent, although as the tale goes, he called one of his friends to tell her that he had something important to say regarding the Philadelphia experiment. A day later, he was found dead. His body was found inside a car, a hose had been connected to the window from the exhaust pipe, and the engine had been turned on. He had apparently taken his own life and died after inhaling the fumes. This has of course led conspiracy theorists to say that he was killed because he knew too much about the secret experiments conducted by the US military, although his friends later came out and said he had talked about killing himself for weeks, even months. That's the sad story of Morris Jessup. Now back to this guy named Carl Meredith Allen, the person who first said he had seen the experiments with his own eyes. He wrote about 50 letters to Jessup relating what he had seen, but at the time he used the name Carlos Miguel Allende. Sometimes he'd say he'd been taught by the great Albert Einstein, and he claimed to understand something called unified field theory. This was a theory introduced by Einstein, and it's not easy to explain in a few words. The dictionary definition is this, a theory that describes two or more of the four interactions, electromagnetic, gravitational, weak, and strong, previously described by separate theories. Or as live science put it, a field theory refers generally to why physical phenomena happens and why these phenomena interact with nature. Anyway, we are guessing Carlos Miguel Allende didn't understand it and he certainly had no proof of it being anything but a theory. To this day, it's never been proven. But Allende wrote to Jessup saying he was sure the theory was possible because he'd seen a ship disappear and that was proof. The thing was, he was the only person at the time who said he'd seen this happen. We should add that some people say it was this delusional man that partly drove Jessup to hooking up his car with the noxious hose. Jessup did at least try to investigate the claim, but there was just no evidence. Allende kept pestering him, saying that it was true, and this frustrated Jessup. In 1957, the Navy's Office of Naval Research even approached Jessup and 
and told him they had received something strange in the post. The package contained one of Jessup's UFO books, but inside were scribbled notes describing extraterrestrial technology and ramblings about unified field theory. Yeah, Allende had done that, although it was supposed to look like the notes had been made by three people or two people plus an alien. It gets stranger, though, because the Office of Naval Research then actually published 127 copies of this book with the added parts. This stress, along with his wife leaving him and his career on the line, no doubt was too much for Jessup. As for Allende, he lived to a ripe old age and died in 1994. During his lifetime, Allende would confess that the whole thing was a hoax, but then later he would change his mind and say it was fact. This is why some people have said he was a delusional publicity seeker, but to those people that believed in UFOs and that the USA has always been doing out of this world stuff at its various black sites, what Allende said was gasoline on a fire. It doesn't help matters that anyone who wants to can see the semen certificate of Carl Meredith Allen. We've seen it. So if any part of this story is true, it's the fact that he was a semen. Then things got even weirder in the 1980s. That's because someone decided to make a movie called The Philadelphia Experiment. Now we all know that we shouldn't believe everything we've seen on the big screen, but for one man watching this film brought back some memories. His name was Al Bilek, and while the film came out in 1984, he watched it four years later. He claimed to have watched the movie, and after that, his repressed memories about the actual Philadelphia Experiment came back to him. He said he'd also seen the ship teletransport. He also claimed to have traveled into the future and seen the mid-21st century. He said he'd been part of something called the Montauk Project. And among other weird things, it was concerned with time travel. According to Bilek, he'd been on board the USS Eldridge when it disappeared. He claimed to have been in the body of another man and been with that man's brother. He said that when the ship disappeared, they both decided to jump overboard, but instead of hitting water, they drifted through clouds until they passed out. When they woke up, they were in a hospital somewhere. They were covered in radiation burns, but what really got their attention was the fact that they were in the year 2137. This all came back to him after seeing that movie. There was more, too, that came back. For instance, he said he'd visited the 28th century. He said cities were then governed by computer systems. At that time, the world was populated by only 300 million people. He made more outrageous claims, such as visiting Mars or describing one of his sojourns in the year of 6037. There was nothing to back up any of this, of course. In 1994, a French astrophysicist and ufologist, Jacques F. Valli, wrote a piece called Anatomy of a Hoax, the Philadelphia Experiment 50 years later. He asked people to read it and come forward if they knew anything about this alleged experiment. One person did, and his name was Edward Dudgeon. He had served in the U.S. Navy during the Second World War. Dudgeon said that during the 1940s, the USA did actually try in some ways to make ships invisible, but it's not what you might think. What they tried to do was wrap electrical cable around the hulls of ships to try to make the ships not visible to underwater mines and magnetic torpedoes. This is hardly paranormal stuff. The Germans had been planting such mines and using magnetic weapons. Those mines were supposed to connect to any passing ships, so the Americans attempted to make that impossible. He said that this process was called degaussing, and that he added at the time that there was this talk of being something that made ships invisible. You could call what happened next the result of Chinese whispers. People talked about invisible ships, and it seems some of them took this literally, not just relating to ships being able to evade magnetic weapons. Furthermore, in 1999, the Philadelphia Inquirer ran a piece about sailors who had served on the USS Eldridge. They said at the time, when it was supposed to have disappeared in Philadelphia, it was actually in Brooklyn. The ship's logs also said that this was a fact. All the sailors who'd been aboard the ship agreed, and so it seems Dudgeon's account of why the hoax manifested is quite credible. Nonetheless, the conspiracy theorists just say that this is the military covering up what really happened. They'll tell you that the sailors had been forced to say that, and indeed, someone somewhere can make great hunks of metal just disappear. It's just a pity no one in this world has seen that happen since. Our conclusion is that the Philadelphia Experiment is about as plausible as the existence of UFOs or that mythical beast in Scotland, the Loch Ness Monster. We believe that Allende likely had mental problems and Jessup was just unfortunate to get caught up in the mess. As for the time-traveling Bilek who'd broken bread with folks in the year of 6037, we dare to say that we think that man was out of his mind. SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force are two of the world's most elite counterterrorism special forces units. Their highly trained operators undertake the most risky and dangerous missions for the US military. And even though they operate under absolute secrecy, we do know that these units have been responsible for some of the highest profile successful counterterrorism missions in recent decades. 
from the dramatic sea rescue of a hijacked ship and crew to the takedown of America's number one enemy Osama bin Laden. We know both units are the best of the best, but if it came down to US Navy SEAL Team 6 versus Delta Force, who would win? The first official Special Forces units were formed in the US in the 1950s, although there's ample evidence of unofficial special operations throughout history, including World War II and even as far back as the Revolutionary War. The Navy SEALs can trace their roots back to World War II's naval combat and underwater demolition teams. These special units were disbanded after the war, but resurrected during the 1950s and 60s during the Korean and Vietnam Wars. When SEAL Team 6, officially known as the United States Naval Special Warfare Development Group, or DEVGRU, was formed in 1980, it was one of only two Navy SEAL teams in operation at the time. The use of the number 6 in the unit's name was a ploy to trick the Soviets into thinking that the US had more active Special Forces units than they really had. Delta Force, or the 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta was formed in the late 1970s in response to worldwide political unrest and a rise in international terrorism. It was inspired by the British Special Air Service, or SAS, and a 1977 proposal painted a picture of an elite force that could respond to highly sensitive situations, including international acts of terrorism. Officially, Delta Force and SEAL Team 6 don't even exist making it hard to get accurate information about their operations and members. Best estimates place the total number of Delta Force operators at around 1,000, and there are an estimated 300 active SEAL Team 6 operators. Unofficially, these two units carry out some of the US military's most dangerous and risky missions, with so many similarities between the two units and the wall of secrecy that surrounds their operations, it's no wonder that people often find it hard to keep them straight. Both SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force are Special Missions Units, or SMUs, under the control of the Secretive Joint Special Operations Command, or JSOC. Both are Tier 1 units, closed teams that are staffed by invitation only. There are only four Tier 1 units in the US in total. SEAL Team 6, Delta Force, the Air Force's 24th Special Tactical Squadron, and the CIA's Intelligence Support Activity Team. The Tier 1 units are the most elite and selective special operations units, and their operators are the best of the best. Both SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force undertake similar clandestine missions, primarily counterterrorism operations, but they're also trained in close quarters combat, hostage rescue, and espionage. But despite their many similarities, the units differ quite a bit in terms of selection and training, operations, and culture. If SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force were ever to go head-to-head, -head, how would these two ultra-elite units fare against one another? Let's find out by taking a closer look at two of the US's most secretive and elite special missions units. One of the main differences between SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force is the way that the units select and vet their candidates. Delta Force candidates largely come from the US Army. Most come from the 75th Ranger Regiment or the Special Forces, but they've also been known to accept candidates from other military branches, including the Coast Guard, the National Guard, and even the Navy SEALs. SEAL Team 6, on the other hand, selects candidates exclusively from within existing SEAL Team units. This gives SEAL Team 6 the advantage of having a common culture among recruits who all came from a Navy SEAL background. The operators often already know each other from previous missions or training. Once candidates have been selected, the process of qualifying and training a SEAL Team 6 operator is quite different from the path that a new Delta Force recruit will follow. Delta Force holds selection courses twice a year at a secret location somewhere deep in the Appalachian Mountains, where more than 100 candidates attend the grueling course. Candidates come from diverse military backgrounds, but are all battle-hardened seasoned soldiers, and still the failure rate is over 90%. The selection course is exactly as tough and demanding as you would expect a course with such a high failure rate to be. Candidates undergo a grueling test of their physical fitness, stamina, and mental determination. Candidates must complete a series of navigation tests where they must navigate a foreign landscape with nothing but an old-fashioned map and compass. They're also subjected to physical endurance tests, like a timed 18-mile ruck march, a nighttime hike carrying a fully loaded 35-pound pack, and a timed 40-mile mission carrying a 45-pound pack over steep, rough terrain. The lucky 10% who manage to survive this grueling test of the selection course are then subjected to a barrage of psychological evaluations and a commander's review before officially being accepted into the unit. Even once they're accepted though, they're not in the clear. New recruits must attend a six-month operator training course, or OTC, where another 30 to 40% of the candidates fail to make the final cut. SEAL Team 6 has a two-part selection process, the review and the green team. 
After a Navy SEAL submits an application, his picture is posted on the wall at the unit's headquarters in the Navy's Damn Neck Annex. Current SEAL Team 6 members who may have worked with the candidate in the past then mark the candidate's photo with a check mark if they should be accepted into the elite unit or with a minus sign if they don't think they'd make the cut. Once a candidate has passed this daunting review, they've earned the right to attend a green team, a six-month-long training and selection course similar to Delta's OTC, where they face a 50% failure rate. The remaining graduates are then drafted. For the rare few that make it through the selection process and are admitted to the elite ranks of SEAL Team 6 or Delta Force, their further training will look remarkably similar. Both units are highly trained in counterterrorism, close quarters combat, hostage rescue, high value target extraction, espionage, explosives, and marksmanship. Thanks to their naval heritage, SEAL Team 6 operators receive additional training in specialized maritime and underwater operations. This gives them an advantage at sea, but Delta Force has an edge in ground combat. In cases where a mission devolves into a large unit action, Delta Force operators can rely on their greater ground combat experience to switch into infantry mode. SEAL Team 6 operators may lack as much experience in large unit infantry tactics as Delta Force given their highly specialized training in small unit tactics. Both units receive similar training because they undertake similar missions and objectives. Because of the clandestine nature of these elite units, we know very little about their actual operations. Though that's changing in recent years, increased media scrutiny and coverage of the elite team's operations is driving a strong public interest in these secretive special forces. Hollywood, always quick to capitalize on a trend, has further raised the profile of these under-the-radar units with a string of blockbuster hits. Black Hawk Down was a dramatic retelling of the 1993 capture of Somali strongman Mohamed Farah Adid by Delta Force operatives. Zero Dark Thirty received five Academy Award nominations for its portrayal of the SEAL Team 6 raid of a compound in Pakistan that resulted in the death of Al-Qaeda leader and 9-11 architect Osama bin Laden. The 2013 film Captain Phillips told the amazing true story of Captain Richard Phillips, played by Tom Hanks, who was rescued by SEAL Team 6 operatives after he was hijacked and kidnapped by Somali pirates in 2009. Because of their overlapping mandates and skill sets, there is certainly some rivalry between SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force. SEAL Team 6 have been called out by Delta Force for courting the spotlight after the takedown of Bin Laden, though this criticism might stem from the fact that Delta Force felt that they should have been the ones to lead that important mission. It was insinuated that the SEALs only got to take the lead because Navy admirals were high in command positions in the JSOC and Special Operations Command at the time. While there may be tension between the groups from time to time, both SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force are on the same side in the War on Terror, and in reality they often work together on counterterrorism missions, albeit unofficially. As you'd expect, these elite teams have access to state-of-the-art weapons and technologies to help them complete their dangerous missions. The HK-416 carbine is thought to be the assault rifle favored by Delta Force operators, though they also have their pick of other high-powered assault rifles like the Colt M4A1 or the M16. Delta Force also uses the MP5 9mm submachine gun, Colt 45 pistols, and Beretta and Glock 9mm pistols. In addition to the impressive array of weapons at their disposal, Delta Force operators are supported by a team of gunsmiths who help customize the moving parts, sights, stock, and grips to each operator's personal specifications and provide Delta Force snipers with hand-loaded ammunition. SEAL Team 6 operators have a similarly impressive weapons cache. They also favor the HK-416 and M4A1 assault rifles, but use Sig Sauer 9mm pistols. SEAL Team 6 also uses the MK-46 and MK-48 machine guns and a modified M79 grenade launcher dubbed the Pirate Gun. SEAL Team 6 snipers have their pick of the world's best sniper rifles, like the MK-11, 12, 13, and 15 medium and long-range sniper rifles, the M82 50 caliber extreme long-range rifle, and the Macmillan TAC-338, which fires the deadly 338 Lapua Magnum round. Now that we know more about the selection process, training, and operations of these special missions units, we can't help but wonder how they'd fare in a head-to-head -head competition. If SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force had to complete identical missions, which team would put up the superior performance? Better yet, how would they fare against each other in a hypothetical adversarial combat situation? In a competition-style head-to-head, it would be a tight race to say the least. 
Both units are highly capable counterterrorism units, and their similar training allows both teams to effectively execute many of the same missions. SEAL Team 6 would have a clear advantage if the competition included a marine element, and their homogenous culture and the fact that the unit members often knew and worked with each other prior to joining the Ultra Elite team might just be enough to give them a slight edge on land too. If on the other hand we were to pit SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force against each other in a brutal battle royale, the unit's similar training and overlapping mission objectives would mean that both teams would know how the other operates, and therefore their usual tactics would be useless. In an adversarial situation they'd have to improvise and rely on combat instincts to survive, and this is where Delta Force has the edge. Unlike SEAL Team 6 operatives, the vast majority of Delta Force operatives have served in the infantry and have direct combat experience, making them more adaptable to changing battle conditions and more effective in an ambush. Whether you think SEAL Team 6 is the last word in Special Forces, or if you're a Delta Force fan through and through, there's no denying that both elite units are head and shoulders above every other unit in the US military, and maybe even the whole world. Let's just hope they never go head to head for real. It's the height of the Cold War, and 300 meters beneath the surface of the stormy North Atlantic, a Soviet submarine steams past the Icelandic coast. The Soviet captain looks to his crew. Everyone is holding their breath, waiting to find out if they've slipped past the formidable NATO anti submarine picket line that stretches from Iceland to mainland Europe. After several tense minutes of silence, the crew relaxes. Sonar can hear NATO patrol ships far away, but not a single one of them has changed course. They haven't been detected. Ordering his men to hold bearing, the captain plots a course a few hundred miles from the American coastline, where his nuclear ballistic missile submarine will loiter undetected, ready to deliver a devastating surprise nuclear attack in case of war. This is how the balance of power between the two great superpowers is kept. Neither side is able to completely eliminate the other's nuclear arsenal completely without being destroyed in kind. Settling in for a long three-month patrol, the Soviet crew breathes a sigh of relief, knowing they've successfully fooled NATO's anti-submarine patrols. Yet unknown to the Soviet sub, a predator stalks the deep cold of the Atlantic, just a few hundred meters behind them. A 370-foot beast made of high-tech steel and aluminum, manned by the US Navy's finest soldiers. The Russians are good submariners, but their subs lack sophistication, and unbeknownst to them a powerful American underwater weapon can detect them from clear across the Atlantic, zeroing in the US Navy's hunter-killer subs on their location. For decades, Soviet nuclear attack submarines believe that they're prowling the oceans of the world undetected, completely unaware of the hidden killers always following their every move. If a nuclear war ever broke out, the Soviet ballistic missile submarine fleet would never get a chance to join the war. Eliminated in minutes by the hidden assassins keyed onto their locations by an incredible piece of American technology, the Sound Surveillance System, or SOSIS. Very rudimentary passive and active sonar systems existed as far back as World War I, but these early systems could only manage detection at distances of a few thousand yards, and even then only under the most favorable conditions. During World War II, sonar technology barely moved past these rudimentary systems, and much anti-submarine surveillance was based on visually identifying the vessels by air as they loitered near the surface to recharge their batteries or bring up their periscopes to target ships. During the 1920s, though, the development of the sonic depth finder was an important first step in developing more advanced and capable sonar systems. Although the various elements of a modern sonar system would not achieve technological maturity or be truly understood until halfway through the Second World War. In 1937, Lay University scientist Maurice Ewing made a critical discovery which would catapult American sonar technology far ahead of its competitors. While doing seismic refraction experiments in water three miles deep in the North Atlantic, Ewing used explosive charges placed at different depths to generate sound waves. As Ewing listened to the echoes of the explosions, he discovered that sound signals at very low frequencies could travel great distances with minimal loss, and he postulated that in certain conditions, so-called deep sound channels could exist which would propagate an acoustic signal for hundreds or even thousands of miles. At the same time, the invention and refinement of the bathythermograph by scientists at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution made possible for the first time the continuous measurement of ocean temperature at various depths, and more importantly how fast the speed of sound varies at different distances below the waves. A growing understanding of how underwater sounds are refracted 
or bent, by variations in the sound's velocity caused by different temperatures and depths helped support Ewing's hypothesis that underwater channels could indeed propagate acoustic signals for as much as thousands of miles. Wasting no time, the Navy immediately authorized a slew of tests for developing these deep sound channels for military use, although at first they would only be used for communications. During the spring of 1944, Ewing supervised a test using the USS Buckley, which steamed away from a receiving ship, dropping explosive charges set to blow at various depths. By determining the pattern of explosions and the depths they occurred at, the Navy hoped to build a system of communication that was impossible to jam, and only required a receiving ship to have nothing more than a basic hydrophone. The explosions from the Buckley were clearly discernible until at last the Buckley had to call off the test after reaching a distance of 900 miles and still being clearly heard by the receiving ship. The test was a huge success, and a system for helping locate and rescue downed pilots was immediately developed. Named so far for sound fixing and ranging, the rescue system consisted of nothing more than a downed pilot dropping a small explosive charge down to the depths of the deep sound channel, where an underwater system of hydrophones would pick up the explosions and triangulate the pilot's exact location. Too late in the war to be of great effect, the rescue signaling system was nevertheless a huge success, but some minds in the US military slowly began to see an altogether different potential to this quirk of underwater acoustics. After World War II's end, the US Navy continued to establish major SOFAR networks in both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, investing in the future security of its downed pilots in case of another major war. Yet as the first chills of the Cold War began to grip the world, the growing threat of a Soviet submarine fleet based on capture German designs urged Navy leadership to develop a more formidable anti-submarine warfare capability based on the detection of underwater sound. By the early 1950s, the US government believed that Soviet submarines posed the greatest threat to American security over any other Soviet weapon, and thus established Project Hartwell. For six months, the best and brightest minds of the American Navy and civilian scientists alike drew together to discuss how to counter the Soviet submarine threat. Long-range submarine detection was premier in the list of topics discussed during Project Hartwell, and a focus of its efforts. The physicist Frederick Hunt electrified the project heads with a stunning and very very convincing idea. Why not use SOFAR to detect Soviet subs? He showed Project Hartwell's leadership that higher frequency sounds made by Soviet subs could be easily detected at ranges of a few hundred miles, but frequencies below 500 Hz would easily penetrate through the various layers of the oceans to reach the deep sound channel from virtually any depth and thus make detection of a noisy Soviet sub possible at ranges of thousands of miles. The US Navy immediately started several highly secret research programs to better understand long-range sound transmission through the ocean. They even partnered with AT&T to begin building underwater listening stations. This budding secret surveillance network was classified with the acronym SOSUS, standing for Sound Surveillance System, and received a top secret classification. In January 1952, the first prototype SOSUS installation was deployed by a British cable layer, and after a series of successful detection trials with US submarines, the Navy approved the installation of more arrays along the entire American East Coast. Two years later, a system would extend to the West Coast and to Hawaii as well, ensuring that no hostile sub could approach the US mainland without being detected. The early SOSIS arrays were fixed directly to the seafloor at specific locations that could access the deep sound channel and oriented at right angles to the expected approach axis of a hostile submarine. The outputs of each hydrophone was transmitted to shore processing stations through multicolor armored cables. At these shore-based processing stations, the incoming data was analyzed and observers would look for the distant frequencies given off by rotating machinery. Hundreds of printers at these facilities would output infographs 24 hours a day, constantly monitoring the entire ocean for Soviet signals. Observers would look for distinctive submarine signatures printed on the graphs, and if simultaneous contacts were made with multiple arrays, then a target could be verified and its position triangulated. Moments later, a US sub or surface boat would then be dispatched. SOSIS had originally been designed to detect air-breathing Soviet diesel submarines, 
which would have to surface to snorkel depths to run their diesel engines and recharge their batteries. However, the system's ability to cover a wide range of frequencies at nearly any depth would prove even more effective at tracking deep-diving Soviet nuclear-powered submarines. With the first SOSIS contact on a Soviet nuclear boat west of Norway established in 1962, SOSIS would go on to play a major role during the Cuban Missile Crisis when it detected three Soviet submarines leaving Russian waters heading for Cuba. In 1968, SOSIS made its first detections of Soviet Charlie and Victor-class submarines, proving its worth even against upgraded Soviet designs. It even allowed for the discovery and secret retrieval years later of a Soviet Gulf-class submarine that had sunk north of Hawaii. The US Navy had a silver bullet in its arsenal, and with it the ability to completely shut down the threat of Soviet submarines. Yet the secret of SOSIS wouldn't last. In late 1967, US Navy Chief Warrant Officer John Anthony Walker strolled into the Soviet Embassy in Washington and sold a top-secret radio cipher card for a few thousand dollars. His treachery directly led to the North Korean attack on the USS Pueblo while in international waters, an act which was later revealed to have been coordinated by the Soviets, who wanted access to the encryption devices stored aboard so that they could make full use of John Walker's leaked intelligence. Aboard the Pueblo, though, the Soviets discovered some details about SOSIS, and through subsequent spying soon discovered the fact that their submarines had been tracked almost effortlessly for two decades. Immediately after the John Walker betrayal, Soviet submarine designs became much quieter and thus harder to detect. SOSIS continued to operate, however, until the end of the Cold War, and in 1993, with the threat of Soviet submarines nothing more than a memory, the system was turned over to civilian researchers who adopted it for studying whale migrations and communication. In 1996, SOSIS's big brother, the Advanced Deployable System, became operational, as the need to monitor the world's oceans for new threats once more became vitally important. The United States has a problem. The Chinese Navy has officially become the world's largest navy. Thankfully, the capabilities of the Chinese Navy are decades behind that of the American Navy, but in any confrontation with China, the US Navy will at best only be able to call upon 60% of its fleet, thanks to naval commitments elsewhere in the world. When forced to face off against just over half of the US fleet, the Chinese Navy's chances for victory in any Pacific conflict quickly escalate. For now, though, the US Navy doesn't need to worry. China is still not a true blue water navy that's capable of operating for extended periods of time far away from its own shores, although it has sent task forces to the Horn of Africa to aid in anti piracy efforts. Overall, on a ship to ship basis, the Chinese Navy's technology ranges from a decade to four decades behind the United States, especially amongst its very noisy submarine forces. Yet the situation is quickly changing. China has in recent years funded a major investment in its naval forces, which has has resulted in a frenzy of shipbuilding. Currently, China outbuilds the United States when it comes to ships. Though again, it's important to remember that the capabilities of each ship so far fails to match up to those of American ships. Also, this is still the initial surge phase of China's new modern navy. After reaching a predetermined target number of ships, the shipbuilding frenzy will slow to a rate similar to the US's. China's growing naval might is worrying not just the United States, but many of China's own neighbors who have routinely been bullied by China's growing might. Japan, the Philippines, and Vietnam, to name a few, all have serious disputes with China, which has on numerous times claimed territory rightfully within their territorial waters for itself. China's frenzy of island building in the South China Sea has also sparked international concerns, and while President Obama's shifting of naval power to the Pacific quickly halted the island expansions, China has so far refused to vacate the five islands it has built. This is in spite of a ruling by The Hague which dismissed China's fanciful claims to the region. Instead, China has fortified its South China Sea holdings, adding radars, flight lines for combat planes, and missile defense systems. The message is clear, China is not budging. While the US is not seeking a military confrontation with China, its commitments to defend many of the nations that China is currently bullying or intimidating may force its hand. In that case, the US may find itself with its hands full dealing with Chinese naval and ballistic missile power, unless radical reforms of the American Navy take place. The greatest threat to American naval forces in the Pacific is China's staggeringly large stockpile of anti-ship ballistic missiles. These giant missiles can be fired from the heart of China and guided to their target as far out in the Pacific as Guam by a system of space and airborne radar and targeting assets. With thousands of these missiles, the US fleet appears to be in serious jeopardy. To counter the ballistic missile threat from China, the US Navy has adopted a doctrine of dispersed operations, while in the past battle groups would be centered around an aircraft carrier to fight relatively close together. The new doctrine has led the Navy to widely disperse its battle groups so as to make each individual ship harder to hit. 
New investments in anti-ballistic missile systems have also added robust capabilities to American fleets, and a new generation of anti-missile missiles have performed very well in testing. Yet a major problem for the U.S. Navy is the sheer number of ballistic and conventional missiles China could throw at American ships. While it's highly unlikely that China would be able to achieve air superiority against the U.S. Navy, new extremely long-range anti-ship missiles would see China fighters able to use their weapons against American ships from hundreds of miles away and never even get close to American interceptors meant to protect their ships from this threat. Then there's the threat posed by Chinese submarines, which could fire off anti-ship missiles while lurking under the waves. They would need to be closer to their American targets than Chinese jets, but would still be able to operate far outside of the traditional security envelope established around American battle groups. One solution to these twin problems is to simply push out the radius of the security envelope around a battle group. Unmanned refueling tankers are already being deployed amongst American fleets, and this will allow a carrier's combat air patrol to operate much further away than normal, which will let them enter intercept Chinese aircraft before getting close enough to fire. To counter the submarine threat, the U.S. Navy under its Ghost Fleet Overlord program has been testing autonomous ships that can assist manned ships in combat. One of these ships is an anti-submarine warfare platform, which would patrol the waters around a battle group completely on its own, searching for Chinese subs and engaging any discovered. Another key to defending American ships in the Pacific is a heavy investment into technologies and tools to disrupt China's kill chains or a chain of assets required to successfully launch a ballistic missile and accurately guide it to its target a thousand miles away. This includes space-based and airborne surveillance and radar platforms, as well as communication nodes, and while details remain classified, the US so far remains confident that it can disrupt China's kill chain capabilities enough to protect most of its ships. For their part, the Chinese have never demonstrated they have the sophistication to implement and protect a kill chain system that can successfully target and destroy a ship far out at sea. New plans are calling for a heavy investment by the U.S. in anti-ballistic missile systems, such as directed energy weapons and kinetic interceptors such as railguns. Currently, one of the biggest problems with protecting American fleets is not an inability to accurately target and destroy incoming missiles, but simply that China would rely on overwhelming barrages meant to force U.S. ships to expend all the missiles in their batteries trying to protect themselves. Once each ship's battery is depleted, it is for all intents and purposes defenseless against incoming missiles, especially of the ballistic variety. A directed energy weapon would have no magazine size limits, as it would fire off electrical power generated by the ship. It could fire for as long as the ships generate electricity and intercept incoming missiles at the speed of light, making it incredibly accurate. High energy lasers could burn out missile warheads and guidance electronics, causing them to prematurely detonate or simply fly out of control. Kinetic railgun interceptors would still need a magazine of projectiles, but these projectiles are both much cheaper to produce than a modern missile and can be made much, much smaller. A single railgun battery could hold hundreds of rounds for a fraction of the cost of a traditional vertical launch cell on a big warship. But even those innovations aren't enough to successfully defeat China at sea, because the fact remains that China has invested extremely heavily in both anti-ship ballistic and traditional missiles. To make matters worse, the U.S. Navy's current ship designs are only making China's job of destroying them easier. For decades, U.S. ships were built around extremely powerful suites of radar and other sensors, which gave them incredible situational awareness and command of their battle space, but in a modern war also make them incredibly easy targets to find for any sophisticated foe, such as China. In essence, U.S. ships and their sensor systems put out so much electronic noise that finding them out at sea would be easy for China, as it would be for you to find a screaming person in a pitch black room. High energy sensor systems are an absolute necessity for any naval force, so simply doing away with them is not realistic. Instead, the Navy needs to seriously rethink its current force structure. At the moment, the US Navy is very destroyer and cruiser heavy. It's the biggest, meanest guy on the block and packs the strongest right hook in the world. To defeat China and not suffer catastrophic losses in doing so, the American Navy needs to go on a serious diet and slim down. Rather than relying on traditional concentrations of big destroyers and guided missile cruisers, the US Navy needs to slash funding for those large ships and invest in a force of mid-range ships about half the size of a modern destroyer. These smaller ships would carry less ordnance, but would be cheaper to build, maintain and operate, and could be fielded in large numbers versus smaller numbers of bigger ships. 
These medium-sized ships would be widely dispersed across a battle space, and thanks to their sheer numbers and smaller profiles, enough of them could get close enough to Chinese forces with an acceptable degree of risk that they could take advantage of passive sensors to track and target Chinese ships and shore targets. Passive sensor systems put out much less energy than active systems, and thus a larger network of smaller ships could relay targeting data back to the main battle group while remaining relatively undetected. America's big guns could safely remain undetected at sea and still be able to service targets accurately. New studies call for these smaller ships to be completely unmanned or at least optionally manned with crews no greater than 24. In fact, the US Navy is looking to adopt unmanned ships in a big way, literally and the service is right now testing two large unmanned ships. Under program Ghost Fleet Overlord, the US Navy intends to build several large unmanned vessels or LOVES to support its traditional manned forces. The goal of these LOVES will be to offset the risk of battle groups being overwhelmed by saturation strikes and expending all of their missile batteries in self-defense. In essence, each LOVE will be nothing more than a seaborne missile battery, housing hundreds of missiles, which could either be fired remotely at targets or used to resupply battle groups at sea. Nicknamed Arsenal Ships, the concept dates back to the 1980s, and each individual ship could carry about half the firepower of an entire battle group. That's a hell of a lot of punch in just one ship, but many experts fear that that's exactly the problem. These big robotic missile ships will still rely on extremely powerful active sensor systems that will be easy for Chinese forces to spot and target. Arsenal ships also have one other major downside. They serve no purpose outside of an actual war. Unlike traditional manned ships, arsenal ships could not be deployed on training missions, relationship building missions with a friendly country, or counterterrorism missions. They would have only a single use, in only a single scenario, giving the Navy a lot less bang for its buck dollar for dollar. Instead, experts are calling for the Navy to switch from large robotic arsenal ships to the fleet of smaller unmanned or optionally manned ships we discussed earlier. Not only will this give the Navy a much greater survivability against Chinese missile forces, but the ships could still carry out a range of peacetime missions as well. In fact, a recent study showed that for the same price, the US Navy could actually get 1.4 times the missile tubes going with a fleet of smaller ships than the current plan to purchase lower numbers of big robot arsenal ships. In the end, hopefully the Navy never needs to implement any of its plans to defeat China at sea, as nobody wants to see a confrontation between the two nations. Yet, for the US and many of the South Pacific nations that have found themselves bullied by China in the last decade and a half, it's a comforting thought to know the US Navy is always preparing for that unfortunate happenstance. The United States Navy and the United States Coast Guard For anyone not in the know, they might be curious as to what the real difference is between the two services. After all, they both pretty much just operate out at sea, and they both use military caliber vessels. So what's the real difference between the two? And why do we even need a Coast Guard? Why doesn't the Navy just do both jobs itself? In 1790, the United States was facing a dire naval situation. Its shores were being regularly ravaged by pirate vessels, many of which were sponsored by Britain. In an attempt to protect its increasingly important overseas trade, the United States Congress authorized a proposal by the Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, to build a fleet of 10 cutters. This date, August 4, 1790, is officially recognized as the birthday of the United States Coast Guard. And within three years, the nascent Coast Guard, then known as the Revenue Cutter Service, had seen its first anti-piracy action. When war broke out with France in 1798, revenue cutters made up about one-third of the total US fleet. Though incredibly, they ended up seizing 18 out of 20 vessels captured by the US ships during the war. During the subsequent War of 1812, revenue cutters clashed with British vessels, and in one engagement the crew of an ambushed American cutter fought so ferociously that the British captain of the attacking vessel returned the revenue cutter's sword to her captain in tribute to the skill of his fighting men. It wouldn't be until 1915 that the US Coast Guard got its official namesake, when the Life Saving Service, a system of patrol ships dispatched to rescue sailors in distress, and the Revenue Cutter Service were merged together into one service. On the 6th of April 1917, the US declared war on Germany, and the Navy broadcasted Plan 1 Acknowledge to all Coast Guard bases and stations, officially transferring control of all US Coast Guard assets to the US Navy for the duration of the war. In support of the war, six Coast Guard cutters were dispatched to Europe for convoy escort duties, while smaller vessels patrolled the waters off the American coast in search for German subs. This would be mirrored two decades later, when the US Navy once more assumed control over the Coast Guard and its vessels. In both wars, Coast Guard ships defended convoys from German subs and suffered losses of ships and sailors in attacks. The US Navy was officially established on October 13, 1775 
Despite being outgunned by the mighty British Royal Navy, America has historically had a rich naval tradition, given the vast amount of trade it engages in with overseas powers. This meant that the rebel colonies had a rich pool of experienced sailors, captains, and shipbuilders, and in little time the first vessels of the Continental Navy were putting out to sea. Despite being overwhelmingly outgunned by superior British vessels, American captains nevertheless managed to secure several strategic wins, or turn British victories into Pyrrhic victories with little true value. After winning the Revolutionary War, the United States disbanded its navy as it could not afford to keep it financed. Without the funds to pay tribute to the Barbary states, the nations that made up the north coast of Africa, American ships were plundered by Barbary pirates. The situation only grew worse when in 1793 a truce was negotiated between Portugal and Algiers, which ended Portugal's blockade of the Strait of Gibraltar and allowed the Barbary pirates to escape the Mediterranean. As a result, 11 American vessels and their crews were captured and sold into slavery. This led the US Congress to approve the Naval Act of 1794, which authorized the building of six frigates. In 1798, when war was declared on France, the US Navy was officially re-established. After fending off French vessels during the war, the Barbary pirate states declared open war on the US in 1801, when the US refused to pay tribute. This led the US Navy to conduct the first foreign conquest of an enemy state, battling Barbary ships in Tripoli and landing a contingent of American Marines to capture the city of Derna. During the War of 1812 against the British, the US Navy found itself greatly outgunned and outnumbered by the Royal Navy. As a result, most of her best ships were blockaded in port, and many were captured by ground assaults and burned at the docks. Despite this, the US Navy managed to capture several British ships, and even had a brief but highly successful campaign against British merchant ships in the Pacific. Key victories in the Great Lakes by the US Navy denied the British several key strategic concessions during the negotiations for peace, and these victories ensured that the US Navy would remain fully funded even after the war was over. At last, the United States would have a respectable and full-time navy. During the American Civil War, the Union Navy completely dominated the Confederate Navy, and the blockade of southern ports proved devastating to the Confederacy, hasting along the end of the war. It would be this war, however, when the world would witness the effects of battle between two ironclads, new ships that were fully armored with metal plating for the first time. On March 9, 1862, the whole world acknowledged that wooden ships were officially obsolete, as Union and Confederate ironclads attacked each other while tearing through the wooden hulled ships of both sides. The US Navy would sadly decline until just prior to World War I, when it became the second most powerful navy in the world after the Royal Navy. With World War II, though, the US surpassed the Royal Navy and officially became the most powerful navy on Earth. Today, the American Navy remains head and shoulders ahead of its nearest competitors and is matched by no other navy anywhere. So now that we know about the two services, just what is the difference between the two, really? Well, essentially both services have a similar but distinct job. The US Coast Guard is America's primary enforcer of maritime law, a task that the US Navy may occasionally assist with but does not actively partake in. The Coast Guard's civil duties are multiple and they're responsible for their age-old tradition of maintaining lighthouses, buoys, and other navigational aids for civilian traffic, although admittedly the only lighthouses in official operation today are automated. The Coast Guard routinely monitors ship traffic to ensure that all vessels of all sizes are obeying proper maritime rules and regulations. They also help keep traffic manageable at some of the world's busiest ports, as well as combat smuggling and illegal immigration by searching for stowaways or responding to a ship who's discovered them hidden on board. Famously, the US Coast Guard is the primary deterrent to drug smuggling on the ocean and operates a fleet of about 200 cutters and smaller patrol craft to chase down suspected smugglers. Recently, a video of Coast Guard officers stopping a drug smuggling submarine has gone viral, and this is the job the Coasties do every day. The Coast Guard, however, is also responsible for responding to disasters at sea. When your ship is going down in rough waters and you desperately need help, it's the Coast Guard who will come to rescue the day. No matter what nationality you are, as long as you're in American waters, you have a guardian angel on your side, and that's a Coast Guard helicopter carrying rescue divers who have one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. However, in wartime, the Coast Guard can also be called upon to supplement the abilities of the US Navy. While today its national security cutters aren't equipped with the heavy long-range firepower needed to take on most military vessels, they still pack a formidable wallop with a 57mm gun, 
a 20mm Phalanx Sea Whiz for close range defense against drones, small boats and anti ship missiles, and four 50 caliber machine guns, and four 762 caliber machine guns. The real strength of each cutter, though, is the robust suite of communications and intelligence sensors, which allow a ship to act as eyes and ears for Navy ships anywhere within their theater of operations. A national security cutter may lack the heavy firepower to go toe to toe with a modern warship, but it has everything it needs to target an enemy vessel and call in a strike from a friendly naval vessel. In essence, the US Coast Guard is responsible for the coasts and various waterways of the United States. In a war, they can supplement the US Navy and ensure that any enemy combatant entering or even approaching American territorial waters or those of Canada or Mexico is quickly engaged by nearby Navy vessels or land-based air power. The US Navy's core mission is pretty much the exact opposite of the Coast Guard, and their primary wartime objective is to ensure that no enemy force ever sets foot on American soil. To achieve this, it operates the largest fleet of surface and subsurface vessels anywhere in the world, and the US Navy on its own is more powerful than its next dozen competitors put together. A nation with a rich maritime tradition, the US has long put an emphasis on a strong navy, and it now sees the navy as the primary peacekeeping tool in its toolbox. The US Navy's real mission, however, is to ensure global stability and flow of free trade. Figuring that as long as the world was busy trading with itself, it wouldn't want to go to war and disrupt lucrative trade with its neighbors. To this end, the American Navy has a global presence to help reassure weaker powers that their merchant vessels won't be harassed, whether by pirates or hostile foreign nations. Where once tribute was demanded of seagoing vessels by various rogue or national states, today the world enjoys global free trade thanks to the US Navy and its NATO allies. To achieve its objectives, the US Navy operates the largest force of aircraft carriers in the world, totaling at 10 Nimitz-class carriers and one of the brand new Gerald R. Ford class. The naval air power of the American Navy combined with that of the US Marine Corps makes it the second largest air force in the world. These aircraft carriers are themselves supplemented by nine amphibious assault ships, formerly known as amphibious assault carriers. These were typically helicopter carriers equipped with amphibious landing craft but now sport vertical takeoff or short takeoff and landing aircraft. Ten amphibious transport docks can land hundreds of American troops at any time anywhere in the world within days of hostilities breaking out. And a further two are under construction as tensions with China in the South Pacific rise. A further 12 dock landing ship supplements America's already prodigious amphibious forces. And given that the US has total dominance in its own global hemisphere, it only makes sense that it places so much emphasis on having a navy capable of conducting expeditionary amphibious landings. If you've seen our video on the United States versus the world, then you already know that it's exactly this lack of transport capability that would allow the US Navy to fight the world's navies to a standstill and make an invasion of the Americas impossible. To knock enemy ships out of the water, though, the US Navy has a fleet of 22 Ticonderoga-class guided missile cruisers, each armed with dozens of various types of missiles, ranging from fleet air defense to anti-ship and even dual purpose. The backbone of the Navy's surface power, however, comes from its fleet of 67 Arleigh Burke-class destroyers and two Zumwalt stealth destroyers currently deployed. These ships do exactly as their name implies, and are the heaviest surface combatants since the retirement of battleships by the world's navies. Prowling under the waves all around the world is the deadliest submarine fleet in the world, with 35 Los Angeles attack subs, 3 Seawolf class subs, 15 Virginia class subs, and 14 Ohio class subs. While its anti-submarine capabilities severely atrophied after the end of the Cold War, the US still fields the most advanced subs in the world and are considered just as stealthy as new diesel-electric subs being fielded today by smaller navies. Unlike diesel-electric subs, though, nuclear submarines offer a far greater endurance and allow the US Navy to engage enemies far from home and threaten hostile fleets in their own territorial waters. The US Coast Guard and the US Navy could be seen as two branches on the same tree, but have markedly different mission sets. While both in peacetime and war, the services lend aid to each other and support each other's missions, ultimately the US Navy is considered the bigger cousin, and it's likely that in another major conflict the Coast Guard would once more fall under the Navy's jurisdiction. In the early 2000s, American fighter jets flying off the coast of California encountered something strange. A small, pill-shaped object was observed to be close to the ocean's surface, possibly rising up out of the water and flying high up into the sky. Giving chase, the F-14 pilots were completely blown away by the strange craft's incredible speeds. Ever since the release of this and other videos captured by American fighter pilots of strange UFOs, speculation has swirled around their true identity. 
The flight characteristics of the craft in these videos are truly incredible, and if radar reports are to be believed, their acceleration abilities puts them light years ahead of any earthly military tech. However, in 2019, investigative journalists discovered patents filed by the United States Navy, and one of those included a craft capable of recreating the same feats witnesses have been reporting for years. Dubbed the UFO patents for the incredibly advanced nature of the technology they claim to make possible, this series of patents run the gamut from room temperature superconductors to an aircraft capable of traveling through the ocean, the air, and space in the same flight, and even more far-fetched truly science fiction ideas like an electromagnetic field generator that could be used as a force field. If these ideas sound completely far-fetched and out in left field, you're not alone, with the US Patent Office initially refusing to file these patents until the United States Navy stepped in and forced the issue. Crazy patent ideas are nothing new. Everything from perpetual motion machines to wireless transmission of energy devices have been patented from time to time, and not one of them have ever achieved what they claim to be capable of. However, none of these patents had the backing of the United States Navy, and none of them came from top scientists working on some of the Navy's most sensitive research and development programs. The man behind these revolutionary patents is a Dr. Salvatore Cesar Pais, and unlike most garage wannabe ricks, this doctor has some serious credentials. He's worked at the Naval Air Warfare Center for years, developing aerospace technologies to be used both on jet fighters and intercontinental ballistic missiles. Today, Dr. Pice works for the U.S. Navy Strategic Systems Programs, which is responsible for the U.S. Navy's nuclear missiles and ballistic missile submarines that carry them. However, this office also investigates a wide range of global strike technologies, including a hypersonic weapon now in development that could strike any target in the world within an hour. Not much else is known about Dr. Pice, who has declined interviews on his patents. Other scientists have reviewed the filed patents and claim they violate the laws of physics and call them absurd. Yet that doesn't change the fact that the US Navy has so far stuck to its guns in support of these patents. And what's more, leaked internal emails show that at least one of these revolutionary ideas was already prototyped and tested successfully. First though, let's go over all of Dr. Pius's patents. By far, the most eye-catching patent is for a craft that, if it performs as stated, would very closely mirror the flight characteristics often observed from UFOs by eyewitnesses. Named the hybrid underwater aerospace craft, this vehicle comes equipped with an inertial mass reduction device, which we suppose is what would allow the craft to perform the incredible feats of acceleration and maneuverability Dr. Pies claims it's capable of, able to launch from land or from underwater, fly into the ocean, back out, and up into space. This man-made UFO would not just revolutionize air warfare, it would instantly make every other nation's fighter and bomber fleets obsolete. By generating a quantum vacuum state around itself, the craft repels air and water molecules, essentially completely ignoring the effects of friction. As an added benefit, the craft would be almost undetectable, or at least fly too fast to make detection completely meaningless. Another of Dr. Pius's patents include room temperature superconductors, which in and of themselves would be a revolutionary scientific leap for mankind. Current superconductors must operate at extremely low temperatures, greatly losing efficiency as they warm up. This has prevented their use in anything but extremely niche and very expensive technologies. Room temperature superconductors promise to change all that. Able to transmit electricity without resistance, superconductors would create an energy revolution, dramatically lowering the price of electricity. These superconductors would make incredible breakthroughs in maglev mass transit technology and magnetic resonance imaging, among a host of other revolutionary effects on human society. Interestingly, Dr. Pius's all-American UFO depends on room temperature superconductors to operate. Dr. Pius's third patent is for a high-frequency gravity wave generator, a device which, if possible, seems to indicate Pius and the US Navy know more about the fundamental nature of gravity than the global physics community. Gravity waves pass through us from time to time, typically as a result of two massive stars crashing into each other millions of light years away. These gravity waves could be considered very low frequency though, and what Dr. Pius's patent proposes is the generation of very high frequency gravity waves, which can have a wide range of applications. As gravity waves propagate, they compress matter in front of them and expand it behind them in the same way a surf wave does to water. The waves that occasionally wash over our planet from far away in space are so low frequency that even just detecting them requires one of the most sensitive instruments mankind has ever built. Yet if you were to generate gravity waves of a high enough frequency, 
you could potentially wreak havoc on anything you aimed your gravity wave gun at, destroying even the most well-protected and armored installation. In Dr. Pies' patent, though, he claims that he can use this high-frequency gravity wave generator to facilitate superconductivity, and perhaps this is the secret behind his room temperature superconductors. As if the previous three patents weren't outlandish enough, Dr. Pius's third patent could literally save the Earth, or destroy it. His electromagnetic field generator is claimed to be able to deflect or destroy an asteroid over the 100-meter size limit that current asteroid deflection methods are thought to be able to protect the Earth from. By generating an extremely powerful electromagnetic field that can interact with an object at the quantum level, Dr. Pies' asteroid destroyer could obliterate an incoming asteroid. Or as his patent very ominously describes, the present invention may also deflect or destroy any other type of object. However, Dr. Pies' asteroid death ray is more than an offensive weapon, as he claims that this device can also be used as an impenetrable shield capable of protecting facilities, vehicles, individuals, or even spacecraft from everything from ballistic missiles to coronal mass ejections. Dr. Pius's patents seem to indicate truly revolutionary technologies that would fundamentally change the human race, or at least America. However, many physicists note that these patents seem to completely violate the laws of physics as known, and don't lend these outlandish inventions any real credence. Despite this, Dr. Pius continues to receive the full support of the United States Navy, and as we mentioned before, leaked internal emails seem to indicate that at least one of these devices was successfully prototyped. Perhaps it's a shell game put on by the US military to throw potential adversaries like Russia and China off the trail of real technological breakthroughs, or perhaps the United States military is about to completely revolutionize the state of mankind's technology. Only time will tell. Since the end of World War II, the US and Britain have been close allies, supporting each other through countless minor and major conflicts. But how do the navies of these two nations compare? That's what we'll find out in this episode of the Infographic Show, US Navy versus British Royal Navy. At the height of its power, Great Britain ruled over an empire so large that it was famously said the sun never set on it. Through a powerful navy, this small island nation exerted its influence across the globe, remaining on top of the world order for hundreds of years. The US, by comparison, has historically fielded a much smaller navy, though its stunning victories have become maritime legend. After World War II, with the decline of the old powers, the US invested heavily in its navy and quickly became the premier naval power of the modern age. So how do the two navies stack up against each other today? After the grueling wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, both nations are facing problems in the manpower department. For the Royal Navy though, this has meant the mothballing of two of its most powerful ships due to a lack of qualified personnel. Though its 2020 plans call for a force of 82,000 sailors, it's highly unlikely Britain will achieve this goal as it currently only holds 32,000 seamen on active duty with 3,000 in reserve. By comparison, the US Navy fields a force of over 319,000 active duty personnel with almost 100,000 in the reserves. However, though the US has not suffered from a loss of ships due to a lack of personnel, its sailors, many of whom have been on rotating six-month deployments for over a decade, are facing historic rates of low morale and deployment fatigue. While the Royal Navy has new ships in construction, it has also faced severe cutbacks to its budget, which has reduced the number of total ships in its inventory to 73, of which only 30 are combat ships, with the rest being support or patrol craft. The US, meanwhile, has increased the budget of its navy, and not only has a new generation of ships coming online, but it's actively increasing the size of its inventory. As it stands, the American Navy fields a force of 284 ships, of which 160 are combat ships, though new budgets call for a total force of 308 total hulls by the mid-2020s. As the vanguards of any modern navy, the aircraft carrier is arguably the single most important ship in any fleet. The US currently operates 10 Nimitz-class supercarriers, with two of its next-generation Ford-class supercarriers coming online soon, and six more in acquisitions. US Nimitz supercarriers are the largest warships ever built, at a length of 1,092 feet and a total displacement of over 100,000 long tons. Each supercarrier hosts an air wing of 90 aircraft, though unlike any other navy, American carrier air wings comprise a total strike package of fighter, strike aircraft, early warning, electronic warfare, and airborne refueling aircraft, making each supercarrier a mini air force onto its own. Through its carrier air wings alone, the US maintains a force of 900 total aircraft. The British Royal Navy fields only a single aircraft carrier, the HMS Queen Elizabeth, though a second Queen Elizabeth class carrier is currently under construction and expected to be operational in 2020. 
As the largest ship ever built for the Royal Navy, the Queen Elizabeth comes up shy of its American cousins at 920 feet and a displacement of 64,000 long tons. It is equipped with 40 total aircraft to include dual-purpose fighter strike aircraft and airborne refueling. However, due to a lack of arresting gear and catapult launch systems, the Queen Elizabeth can only launch Stovall, or short takeoff and vertical landing aircraft, which places a severe restriction on the size of a weapons package each plane can be equipped with versus an American plane. As the second most important element of a modern navy, submarines make up a sizable portion of a naval complement. The Royal Navy currently fields 10 total subs, with 6 guided missile submarines and 4 nuclear ballistic missile submarines. Of its attack subs, 3 are of its new, modern, astute class, and 3 of the older, though still formidable, Trafalgar class. The United States, by comparison, deploys a total of 66 submarines, of which 52 are nuclear-powered attack subs and 14 are nuclear ballistic missile submarines. Of its attack subs, 34 are of the aging Cold War-era Los Angeles class, which, along with the three Seawolf class still in service, are being replaced by the next-generation Virginia class, of which 15 are already in service. Destroyers make up the bulk of a Navy's surface warfare component, with the flexibility to provide both fleet defensive and offensive capabilities. The US currently has 67 destroyers, of which 65 are of the Arleigh Burke class, the first ship designed around the formidable Aegis combat system. In service since 1988, the US Navy plans a future purchase of 24 more ships upgraded to the Type 3 variant. This leaves it with two of three planned Zumwalt class destroyers, with any future purchases cancelled. Though currently the stealthiest surface ship in the world, the Zumwalt class has been plagued with cost overruns and a lack of mission focus. This lack of focus, combined with the cancellation of specialized ammunition for its main cannon, which would have cost a whopping $800,000 a shell, has prompted America's Congress to cancel development of more ships, though the high-tech lessons learned have already been incorporated into future ship designs. The Royal Navy currently operates only six destroyers of the Daring class. Replacing the Sheffield class, the Darings are primarily focused on anti-aircraft and anti-missile roles, leaving them with a lack of anti-ship or land strike capability versus the American Arleigh Burks. However, their focus on anti-air and anti-missile missions has many defense industry experts on both sides of the Atlantic considering them the best air defense ships in the world. Unfortunately, the future of Britain's destroyer fleet is in serious question, as originally 12 Daring class destroyers were planned for procurement, only to have the number drop to 8, and then to finally only the 6 currently in service. The designation of cruiser, or frigate, has varied in meaning over time and across navies. It was originally the designation for scout and patrol ships during the Age of Sail, and today it fits a niche that blurs the lines between different classes of ships. Modern cruisers sit somewhere between the roles that World War II destroyers offered as anti-aircraft and anti-submarine support, and a battleship's capabilities to hit surface ships and land targets. Of the cruiser designation, the Royal Navy currently operates 13 ships of the Type 23 or Duke class. Originally designed to counter Russian subs in the North Atlantic, the Type 23 still remains primarily an anti-submarine ship, though it has shown great versatility in air defense and land attack roles over the last three decades. Equipped with only eight American-made Harpoon anti-ship missiles though, Type 23 ships remain dependent on other escorts for protection from enemy surface ships. The Americans, meanwhile, operate 22 Ticonderoga-class cruisers. At a displacement of 9,600 long tons, the Ticonderogas are twice the size of their British counterparts, though this is due to their multi-role design. Equipped with Tomahawk cruise missiles, a Ticonderoga can strike targets on land or other ships while simultaneously defending against incoming air or missile threats with its SM-2 and longer range and more advanced SM-6 missiles. Unlike the Royal Navy's Daring class, the American Ticonderogas are also equipped with the RIM-161 Standard Missile 3, a high-speed and long-range missile developed exclusively to destroy incoming ballistic missiles, though in the mid-2000s, the US Navy demonstrated an ability to destroy enemy satellites with it as well. With over three times the number of ships and personnel, the US Navy is significantly larger than the British Royal Navy. On the whole, American ships are better equipped to handle a variety of threats, making a single American ship more threatening to a potential adversary than its British counterpart. Yet British naval planning has for decades been focused on augmenting the capabilities of their close American allies, not countering them. American and British forces have for a long time trained and operated together, yet it is their navies which are more intimately linked than any other branch of the armed forces. With its commitments to deterring aggression in the North Atlantic from a resurgent Russia, and Chinese military expansionism in the South China Sea, 
The US Navy may be the most formidable force on the high seas, but it would find itself hard pressed to conduct its global mission of keeping the high seas free and open to all without its partnerships with close allies such as the British Royal Navy. It's the Zoomies versus the Squids, the United States Air Force versus the US Navy, two of the most powerful, if not the most powerful forces on Earth, in a head-to-head -head matchup to determine just which branch is the best at their primary purpose, killing bad guys and breaking their stuff. For the sake of this thought exercise, we're going to ignore the normal realities of warfare and focus solely on firepower and assets. After all, in a realistic war scenario, the US Navy could do something the US Air Force could never do blockade ports and stop the shipments of supplies. So we're going to be pitting man and machine in a straight up deathmatch and find out which of the two services come out on top. Despite their close partnership with the US Navy, for this fight the Marines are out. Sorry sailors, but you're fighting this one on your own. Likewise, US Army forces which typically help provide ground security for the Air Force assets are also out, leaving the Zoomies to fend for themselves. Most of this war will naturally happen in the air. Though without the support of their sister services, the US Air Force does have one advantage that the Navy doesn't, the ability to deploy a moderate ground force against Navy targets. The Navy after all isn't just about ships, there's a long link of repair and resupply centers that are vital for keeping America's fleets out at sea. US Air Force Security Forces personnel are traditionally speaking military police no different than their counterparts in the other branches. However, during the Vietnam War, the Air Force realized that it couldn't always rely on the other services for protection of its airfields in hostile territory and quickly established a training program to convert their military police personnel into small but competent infantry forces. Today, Security Forces personnel are all trained in air-based defense and receive qualification training with heavy squad weapons such as the 50 caliber machine gun and the Mark 19 automatic grenade launcher. Some of these personnel are even qualified for air assault operations. Numbers are hard to pin down, but there's an estimated 25,000 US Air Force Security Forces personnel currently on active duty, giving the Air Force a sizable ground assault element that the Navy can't match. While US Navy Masters at Arms are trained in protecting ships and shore installations, their focus and training isn't as exhaustive in ground combat roles as Air Force Security Forces personnel. With the focus shifting from protecting airfields from unsophisticated terror and insurgent threats to a potential showdown against regular Chinese or Russian infantry units, US Air Force Security Forces personnel have recently begun a program to seriously upgrade their standards, training, and equipment to meet these near-peer competitor threats. The stated goal of the US Air Force is to produce a force comparable to US Army Light Infantry, powerful enough to repel a coordinated attack from near-peer competitors. This means new tools such as anti-tank and anti-air man portable weapon systems and fire support platforms such as mortars, as well as a stronger emphasis on assault and defense operations. On the ground, it's clear that the Air Force has a serious advantage, being able to deploy a sizable force to seize vital US Navy ground installations and repel any assaults against its facilities. But the primary combatants in this showdown are going to be aircraft and ships. So how do they measure up, and what can they add to this fight? The first step in this battle between the services will be establishing air superiority, as the primary armament of both services is going to be its aircraft. In the Navy's corner, we have the F-A-18 Super Hornet, an aircraft developed to counter advances in Soviet fighter design. Turns out the Navy completely overcompensated and created one of the most formidable fighter aircraft ever built. Responding to the Navy's Super Hornet threat is going to be the F-15 Strike Eagle, another development created in response to the advancements made in Soviet fighter design. Both aircraft come from the same manufacturer, meaning they share many of the same strengths, making this a difficult matchup to determine. The F-15 is an air superiority fighter, but it's primarily geared for ground attack role. The Hornet is instead a jack of all trades, doing everything from air superiority to suppression of enemy air defenses, recon, and even aerial refueling. That versatility gives the Navy greater flexibility and makes sense for a service which has limited space on its aircraft carriers. The better buy for your money is the aircraft that can do multiple things well, rather than a single specialized task. But in this fight, which is better? The F-15 is powered by dual Pratt & Whitney F-100 turbofan engines, producing 29,000 pounds of thrust at full afterburner, versus the Hornet's General Electric F-414 engines putting out 22,000 pounds of thrust at full afterburner. This gives the F-15 a speed advantage of a whopping 700 miles per hour, with the F-15 clocking in at 1875 miles per hour versus the F-18 at 1190 miles per hour. 
The F-15s are going to get to the fight first every time, and if they get in trouble, they'll easily outrun any pursuing F-18s, leaving them in the dust. By comparison, F-18s trying to flee from the Air Force's Strike Eagles are going to wind up getting splashed. The Eagle also has greater fuel and weapons capacity than the Hornet, with the F-15 carrying up to 23,000 pounds of fuel and weapons versus the F-18's 17,759 pounds. More fuel and more missiles means the Air Force's fighter can stay in the fight longer and shoot more, and gives the F-15 nearly double the range of the Navy's F-18. However, the Navy's F-18 can carry the AGM-88 high-speed anti-radiation missile, giving it a robust capability in destroying enemy ground and even airborne radar, while the F-15 cannot. Conversely, the F-15 can carry the GBU-28 bunker buster bomb, while the F-18 can't. The F-18 is slightly more agile than the F-15, however, which would give it the advantage in close quarters dogfighting. Although, as many enemy combatants around the world have found out, the F-15 is an absolutely terrifying dogfighter itself. Targeting and tracking systems on both aircraft are nearly identical, given that both aircraft operate for the same country. When it comes to long-range detection, the APG-82 radar has greater capabilities than the APG-79 radar used by the Hornet. Although, just how much greater capabilities is a mystery, as the data is a closely guarded secret. What's clear is that the Air Force Strike Eagles will get to the fight first, see their targets first, and fire first, putting the Navy's Super Hornet at a disadvantage. However, the F-18 is equipped with infrared search and tracking capabilities, giving it a chance to take on stealth aircraft at close range. With 769 Hornets versus the Air Force's 454 Eagles, the number advantage may seem to be in favor of the Navy, except the 769 Hornets the Navy possesses represents the entirety of its air attack and air superiority forces. By comparison, the U.S. Air Force can call on an additional 1,017 F-16 Fighting Falcons and 229 operational F-35 Lightnings. The Navy's own F-35s only number at 21 and are currently still only used for training. However, the absolute silver bullet in the sky for the Air Force is its fleet of F-22 Raptors, numbering at 186. While low in number, the Raptor is without comparison the world's most advanced air superiority fighter. Featuring a radar cross-section the size of a marvel, its armament may be limited as it's forced to carry its weapons internally, but its powerful radar allows it to detect enemy aircraft and engage them at beyond visual range. While the Air Force initially wanted a fleet of almost a thousand of these incredible aircraft, the extreme price tag upwards of $220 million per aircraft, as well as a lack of a realistic threat to face off against by any other nation, shelved the original production run and limited it to the number the Air Force currently operates. Simply put, in an air battle, the US Navy is going to come out losing badly. Not only is it completely dwarfed by the numbers of the Air Force air superiority fighters, the Air Force's F-22 presents a threat that an F-18 pilot is unlikely to survive. Luckily, the number of these airborne assassins is relatively low. However, the Navy can call upon support from its large fleet of warships, who thanks to modern battle networks can add their firepower to an air battle. While its fleet of dozens of attack submarines may seem like an odd fish out in this fight, many of them are capable of taking on land attack roles thanks to the addition of cruise missiles to their magazines. With a range of 1,550 miles, Navy subs could deliver crippling blows to U.S. Air Force installations with little if any warning. Likewise, its fleet of 91 destroyers and 19 corvettes could all strike at Air Force airfields. A vast inventory of anti-air missiles such as the RIM-174 and the RIM-162 Evolved Sea Sparrow can project serious anti-aircraft firepower into a fight, leaving U.S. Air Force planes at risk in any air battle within range of U.S. Navy ships. The U.S. Air Force is not the primary service for neutralizing an enemy fleet. That task falls on the U.S. Navy, but it is still very well equipped to deal with hostile vessels. The AGM-158 JASM and the AGM-86 are both extremely long-range standoff attack air-launched cruise missiles, packing a 1,000-pound warhead capable of sinking enemy ships. The AGM-158C is the latest iteration of these anti-ship missiles and features greatly improved technology allowing it to locate, track, and target hostile vessels independently while ignoring civilian shipping. These missiles are all low observable, making them difficult to spot on radar and are programmed to fly extremely close to the ocean's surface, which makes them even more difficult to spot and target by a ship's anti-missile defense systems. However, none of these weapons are supersonic 
as the US is currently coming far behind Russia and China in developing supersonic weapons. This means the individual success rate of each missile is dramatically lowered when pitted up against the Navy's sophisticated anti-missile defense systems. Though the AGM-158C is capable of coordinating with other missiles to conduct swarm attacks, approaching a target from multiple directions in overwhelming numbers. Increasingly, this fight is turning bad for the US Navy. With an air superiority fleet that's less than half the size of the US Air Force, and with aircraft outmatched technologically by the Air Force, the Navy will never be able to establish air superiority. Even more importantly though, the Navy's Hornets will never be able to establish air superiority at the standoff attack distances required to stop Air Force bomber aircraft from launching anti-ship attacks. While Navy fleet defenses are likely capable of chewing up most of the Air Force's surface attack aircraft, the Air Force's ability to attack with long-range precision weapons means their vulnerable bomber aircraft can target and fire from well outside of the air defense envelope of the Navy. One way the Navy plans on protecting its surface fleets from this threat against a near-peer competitor such as China or Russia is to simply establish combat air patrols at greatly extended ranges using F-18s in tanker mode or new tanker drones to refuel F-18s assigned to long-range air patrols. However, no other nation can bring to bear against the US Navy the sheer number and capabilities of the US Air Force, and in a real-world situation, the Navy would always rely on Air Force help to protect its ships. Air power will determine this battle, and the Navy loses in that arena. While Navy ships would be able to launch attacks against Air Force airfields and ground installations, they won't last long against coordinated Air Force attacks by fleets of B-1 Lancers and B-52s equipped with standoff long-range munitions and protected by fleets of F-16s, F-15s, F-35s, and F-22s. Air Force planes would always be able to redeploy to civilian or even improvised airfields, but Navy fighters will find that their only safe landing site, their aircraft carriers, will very quickly end up at the bottom of the sea. With complete and total air superiority, the US Air Force is without a doubt the victor of this conflict. Though in reality, this conclusion is no surprise. Air power has long been the single most important weapon in modern war since World War II, leaving any foe without suitable air power at the absolute mercy of even an inferior army that is supported by a competent air force. However, it's also a matter of different mission sets that sees the Air Force declared a winner. The US Navy is indeed tasked with air superiority, but its vessels are also designed for a wide range of different responsibilities, from surface warfare to subsurface warfare and the escort and deployment of ground combat troops to beaches around the world. The Air Force, however, has a far more limited scope of missions, air superiority, recon, and ground attack and its equipment is thus far more capable in these arenas than the Navy's. In truth, neither service could win a war without the other, and the two are equal and vital partners in ensuring the US military remains the most powerful on Earth. But squids would totally get their butt kicked by zoomies any day of the week. The United States and Russia are two global powers with a complicated history. Given the immense size of the two nations, as well as their power and influence over the rest of the world, they maintain one of the most critical and strategic foreign relationships of any two countries on the entire planet. But how do their armies stack up against each other? Specifically, why don't we take what are widely considered to be their top-tier troops from both countries and examine the key differences in their training, tactics, weaponry, and specialties. For the United States, while some might argue the case for the US Army Rangers or the 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment, better known as Delta Force, it's perhaps more widely agreed that the best that America has to offer in terms of specialized fighters comes in the form of the United States' Navy SEALs. And in the other corner, Russia's most elite branch of its military would have to be none other than the infamous Spetsnaz. Now, it's important to note straight out of the gate, Spetsnaz as a term refers to a lot of different units within the Russian military. The word itself refers to units that are assembled by any special operations group of the Russian military to complete specific missions, whether that be their Navy, Army, Airborne Troop, or even the FSB, formerly known as the KGB. This means there is almost no such thing as a singular Spetsnaz unit. Furthermore, a Spetsnaz unit, assembled for a particular mission, might not consist entirely of active combatants. Some might have computer specialists or even rocket scientists working alongside or consulting directly with special operations troops. Members of both the SEALs and Spetsnaz groups are notoriously secretive since their existence and operations are considered matters of national security to the United States and the Russian Federation, respectively. 
It's largely due to leaks or carefully curated information intentionally released from within these governments that the public has had any knowledge of these two special forces units. Navy SEALs and Spetsnaz are famous, or infamous, depending on your perspective, for conducting high-profile missions, with SEAL Team 6 gaining widespread notoriety and media attention after their involvement in the assassination of Al-Qaeda leader and 9-11 terrorist attack architect Osama bin Laden. Comparatively, the primary difference between certain United States Special Forces groups like Delta Force or the Navy SEALs and Russia's Spetsnaz is that those examples are permanent military units that exist even when not on active duty. Spetsnaz are formed as and when they are needed. So for the purposes of this video, we'll be comparing the Navy SEALs to various different Russian specialized military units that could all qualify as Spetsnaz, such as Alpha Group, Spetsnaz GRU, and Russia's Special Operations Force. So let's begin where anyone hoping to join either the Navy SEALs or a Russian Spetsnaz group would start out, training. In order to join the SEALs, there is the prerequisite that the potential recruit has to already be a part of the United States Navy. This means that they'll have already had to have completed their basic training to join the Navy. From there, entering into training to become a Navy SEAL is entirely voluntary, although it comes with a few other caveats. Volunteers must be between the ages of 18 and 29 years old. They must also be a United States citizen with a high school education or equivalent with a score of at least 220 on their armed services vocational aptitude battery, a multiple choice test that determines whether someone is suitable for enlisting in the U.S. armed forces. SEAL candidates also need to be proficient in all aspects of the English language with at least 2070 vision, no history of drug usage, and they need to pass a physical screening test too, as well as having no prior criminal convictions. And that's just the requirements to become considered. Even ticking all those boxes doesn't guarantee someone will become a Navy SEAL. What are the requirements to enter training to join a Spetsnaz unit? Well, surprisingly, it can be hard to come across accurate information on that. For a while, the exact nature of Spetsnaz training was kept a closely guarded secret, even within Russia itself. The exact regime for new recruits was known only to those directly involved with the special operations, such as the GRU. No, not that guy from Despicable Me who stole the moon. These are the main intelligence directorate, the Russian Federation's foreign military intelligence agency, serving under the general staff of their armed forces. The GRU acronym was used in official capacity during the time of the Soviet Union. However, the modern iteration of the main intelligence directorate is still commonly colloquially known as the GRU. They're responsible for military intelligence operations and maintaining their own special forces units. So until the 1980s, the Soviet GRU would have been the only ones to know of the abilities required to join one of their Spetsnaz units. This secrecy led to a lot of unsubstantiated rumors about Spetsnaz groups until Mikhail Gorbachev, the president of the Soviet Union from 1990 to its dissolution in 1991, who'd also been effectively directing the country as leader of the Communist Party for five years before that, disclosed Russian state secrets in an act of good faith to ease international tensions with the US. After the policy of glasnost, meaning openness, stories of the achievements and abilities of Spetsnaz groups reached the Western world. According to books written by many former agents of agencies such as the GRU or KGB, the training of Spetsnaz recruits was designed to foster similar skills to those of Delta Force or the British Special Air Service. Anyone applying to join a Spetsnaz group didn't need any prior military training and didn't have a long checklist of requirements to start training, like the Navy SEALs. However, to train to join a Spetsnaz group, candidates did need to have completed at least the normal basic training before attempting to meet the harsh requirements of the Spetsnaz training regime. To become a fully-fledged SEAL, volunteer recruits are expected to pass two months' worth of initial training to prepare them, including a series of intense and demanding physical and mental screening tests. They will also have to undergo a rigorous basic underwater demolition slash SEAL or BUDS training program that can last six months. It's said to be one of, if not the toughest of the programs within the US military, enduring a constant barrage of mental and physical conditioning Prospective SEALs are taught several specialized skills necessary for the type of operations they'll be undertaking should they successfully complete their training. These skills include basic water competency in swimming, underwater combat, weapons and demolitions training, and navigational skills on dry land. The BUDS program also includes the infamous Hell Week, a five-day stretch wherein each candidate for the Navy SEALs is subjected to extreme physical exertion at an almost constant rate. Around the clock, recruits are in an almost constant motion, only permitted around four hours of sleep in the entire week. 
That's not four hours per night, it's four or five hours over five whole days, while the rest of the time they are either running, swimming, paddling, carrying boats on their heads, doing sit-ups, push-ups, rolling in the sand, trudging through mud, or paddling aboard boats. If that sounds like a lot to go through, it is proven by the fact that only a quarter of every class of Navy SEAL candidates will successfully complete their BUDS training. Even then, it's still not over. Recruits for the SEALs are then further trained in tactics focused on working as a part of a small unit, parachuting, and operating in icy weather conditions. Making it through all that earns the recruit their trident, the official symbol of the US Navy SEALs. After that point, they're assigned to a team of 16 fellow SEALs, wherein they will undergo several more months of advanced training. And training to join a Spetsnaz group is hardly a picnic either. Russian Special Forces training is as infamously brutal as that of the SEALs, if not more so. With these Spetsnaz training regimes, it's all about escalation. The pressure placed on each potential Spetsnaz candidate is set to exponentially increase, and as it does, so does the pain involved. Each soldier undergoing this regime is pushed to their maximum threshold, not just for physical pain, but mental and emotional anguish as well. Once they reach the absolute limit of their tolerance for all of these, the goal of the training is to push them even further beyond that limit. The exact activities employed in the training can vary slightly depending on which branch of the Russian military or which of the intelligence agencies is training recruits for potential deployment into a future Spetsnaz group. Remember, Spetsnaz are formed as they are needed, so completing training activities doesn't mean a candidate just slots into the roster of an existing unit. Some examples of known parts of the training regime are assault courses. If you've ever gone to an outdoorsy summer camp, not necessarily even a military-adjacent camp, then you might have even tried one for yourself. They can be challenging, but not impossible to complete, right? Now try to imagine doing an assault course while being shot at with real bullets, not blanks, not BBs, or paint. Spetsnaz candidates are put through live fire assault courses as part of their training. To be fair, the US special operation potentials often face similar challenges. Other physically demanding activities they're put through include martial arts instruction with the use of real blades. This has often led to many recruits suffering permanent injuries from just their training alone, ranging from minor non-fatal stab wounds to full-on flesh wounds. Now, skills in hand-to-hand -hand combat aren't much use when your opponent is wielding a firearm, a knife, or even just has a blunt object like a simple rock within reach. But the idea behind Spetsnaz candidates training in hand-to-hand -hand isn't so much for them to implement these skills in battle. It's done more so to instill a sense of physical and mental discipline so that when an enemy opens fire, these future Spetsnaz operatives can ignore the flight part of their natural fight-or-flight response and head toward danger instead of running away from it. Much like their Navy SEAL counterparts beyond general combat training, these Spetsnaz hopefuls are also taught specific skills to the types of missions they engage in. This means learning infiltration methods for covert operations where they might be required to go undercover, such as sabotage, assassinations, and reconnaissance missions. This includes learning foreign languages and receiving training in cultural acceptance to allow these candidates to better blend in with the public of whatever country they're conducting their operations in. They're also taught how to bypass locks and utilize silent kill techniques, as well as parachuting and survival training for long durations in harsh environments. One of the core differences between the Navy SEALs and the various Spetsnaz groups is their purposes, which is reflected in their training. While there is some overlap, the SEALs are primarily deployed on small unit special operations missions in various environments. Given that they're a naval unit, this includes missions that require amphibious warfare, which is fighting in or near bodies of water. However, they also engage in direct raids or assault missions on enemy targets, capturing or killing high-value individuals and gathering intelligence behind enemy lines, among other tasks like sabotage and demolition. This can occur in not just waterfront locations, but also in jungle, urban, arctic, mountainous, and desert environments. Meanwhile, the primary purpose of Spetsnaz teams is to directly or indirectly support other parts of the Russian military, either by assisting them in combat missions or conducting special operations. Their training prepares them for covert operations, which often call for close quarters combat and more unconventional forms of warfare, whereas the various SEAL teams report to a Navy commander who oversees the rotation and operations of the currently active SEAL platoons. Spetsnaz units are subject to a different chain of command structure. Since Spetsnaz is a part of whatever military or intelligence group formed it, they operate under the command of that specific arm of the Russian Armed Forces. A common misconception about Navy SEALs and Spetsnaz operators is that they're intended to be able to do everything and anything. 
The same can be said of almost all special forces across the world. Some believe they're expected to be capable of any and all specialized skills, every conceivable combat style, and are masters of utilizing any firearm imaginable. But these soldiers aren't superhuman, nor are they the kind of action heroes you might expect to see in the John Wick movies. Special forces are about specialization, not about being more than human. Both individual SEALs and Spetsnaz will have their own tasks and unique skill sets. Individual team members may be designated as medics, marksmen, or any number of other roles. Working together, though, the team becomes an elite fighting unit. While SEALs are generally trained to have broader capabilities ranging from reconnaissance to direct action and counterterrorism, Spetsnaz units are typically tailored for specific tasks and made up of personnel with that specific training. There are also various Spetsnaz groups specializing in missions on the front lines. Normally, they're tasked with destroying enemy strongholds and utilized in larger numbers as assault infantry. According to interviews with ex-Spetsnaz commandos, one of their tactics is to send a detached force to carry out an initial strike from the flank. These troops will deliver a quick blow, then move out, either on foot or by vehicle. The operational philosophy for Spetsnaz is always the same, get in and then get out as quickly as possible. Inversely, the Navy SEALs aren't a unit designed to partake in frontline combat. That's often reserved for larger conventional forces such as the infantry divisions of the US Army. Special forces like the SEALs shouldn't be anywhere near the front lines during combat. Their role is to conduct operations behind enemy lines. In some cases where such forces exist, they will assist in training local militants to fight against an enemy, occasionally leading them in smaller assaults, but never fighting head-on with the conventional military. The Navy SEALs are highly effective in reconnaissance operations on a battlefield and other methods of preparing infantry for entering that space. Their other typical small unit missions are counterterrorism operations, which consist of actioning strategies to defeat potential terroristic threats. This is another way in which the SEALs and Spetsnaz groups are similar, as they exist to accomplish a lot of the same goals as each other on behalf of their countries. It's more so the specific ways they function that tend to differ and the specific ways they conduct their operations. Another similarity that's also a difference is how these two forces are armed. Both of them are provided with some of the most impressive and deadly weaponry available to them, but it's their specific choices of arsenal that are different. When it comes to outfitting special forces, their gear is all specially selected depending on the tactics required for an operation. Factors like whether or not a weapon needs to be silent, if an enemy target will be far away or in close quarters, and whether a mission is taking place during the day or night, to name a few. It's no secret that both the Navy SEALs and the Spetsnaz have first pick of some of the best weapons and equipment that the US and Russian military have to offer. Starting with the Spetsnaz groups, it's long been rumored that they've trained with and utilized a piece of equipment known as a ballistic knife, which could fire its blade directly into an enemy's chest. This has since been revealed to be propaganda on the part of the United States, intended to add to the Red Scare and fuel the American public's fear toward Russia. However, that propaganda might have inspired some various Spetsnaz units, as since 1986 some have been issued an NRS-2 survival knife, which can not only cut through wire but can reportedly fire a 7.62mm pistol round up to 25 meters. Other notable Spetsnaz group weapons include the Dragunov sniper rifle and SV-98 bolt-action rifle. Snipers in Spetsnaz units are highly trained and lethal at long distances, many often using modernized SVDS rifles with folding stocks, or the latter bolt-action rifle, which is typically used with a mounted variable magnification scope, giving a range of 1,000 meters. While it can also be fitted with a sound suppressor for stealthier operations, this can severely limit the weapon's mobility. This is why the VSS Vintores sniper rifle, a silent assault rifle, is a Spetsnaz favorite, especially during missions that require a great deal of stealth. Despite being initially developed in the 80s, this weapon still sees widespread use today among Spetsnaz operators. Additional weapons in the Spetsnaz arsenal are the AS Val assault carbine, a silent 9mm assault rifle capable of firing subsonic rounds. Yes, that means each bullet travels slower than the speed of sound, making it perfect for silent missions. There's the AK-74, a standard-issue weapon for Russian soldiers used by Spetsnaz and regular troops. This is one of the many modernized versions of the classic AK-47 that exist, and these are typically lighter and more accurate than the original. The other variations found in the hands of Spetsnaz units also include the AK-103, the AK-12, and AK-15 rifles. Navy SEALs have plenty of expensive toys of their own, too. 
given that they have an extremely large military budget, which is also exclusively allocated to their unit. They have access to top-of-the-line gear. Much like the Spetsnaz's own arsenal, the types of weapons used by Navy SEALs will vary depending on the type of mission they're conducting. Among some of the more commonly used in the hands of Navy SEALs is the M4A1 carbine, a shorter version of the M16 assault rifle, capable of semi-automatic and automatic firing. Its numerous Picatinny rails on the receiver and the handguards allow for various scopes, sights, grips, or other attachments, including underbarrel grenade launchers, to be fitted to the M4A1, giving it a great deal of versatility. SEALs are also known to be fond of the MK-17 SCAR-H, chosen to eventually replace a number of existing weapons used by not only them but other United States Special Forces units too. This is because the MK-17 comes in three different variations, a standard version with a 16-inch barrel, then a shorter 13-inch and a longer 21-inch. These different barrels are designed in such a way that they can be easily switched out, meaning the MK-17 can be altered to suit a desired role, either as a sniper rifle, an assault rifle, or a close-quarters weapon. Then, of course, it would be remiss of us to not mention the pig. And no, that's not a literal pig the Navy SEALs bring into battle, although one of those feral hogs could probably do some damage. The pig is the nickname given to the M60 machine gun, a weapon first developed following the Second World War that first saw a lot of action in the Vietnam War. The M60 and its various updated versions have long been a favorite light machine gun of the US Navy SEALs, given that it could be accurately fired from the shoulder or mounted to gunner positions on vehicles. The SEALs have long favored the M60 since the Vietnam War, and although its use was phased out in favor of more modern weapons in other branches of the US military, the most updated version, the M60E4, was still suited to the missions the SEALs conduct. Since they're often sent on raids and operations wherein traveling light is essential and the Navy SEALs are specialists in amphibious warfare, moving from water to land quickly, the M60E4 weighing less than some newer machine guns and operating reliably in salt water meant it saw continued use up to the modern day. Overall, in terms of armaments, the case is pretty much the same for both. Their firearms are subject to change depending on what the objectives and requirements of the particular mission are. Navy SEALs and Spetsnaz operators alike can use a wide array of assault rifles, submachine guns, light machine guns, sniper rifles, and pistols. While both the US Navy SEALs and various Russian Spetsnaz groups are both highly trained units, equipped with a wide range of weapons and skills that enable them to complete their operations, the primary focus and structure of both these Special Forces units are different. The Navy SEALs specialize in a variety of small unit operations, while the different Spetsnaz groups vary in their function depending on which branch of the Russian military organized them. But in terms of which of these groups would be able to take on the other in direct combat, well, it's hard to say with any degree of certainty. Neither one usually engages in pitched battles like regular infantry. Given the specific types of missions SEALs and Spetsnaz are trained for, both possess soldiers in near-peak physical condition and a skill level that would make them fairly evenly matched. After all, the United States and Russia spent a staggering amount of their already enormous military budgets to ensure these units receive the highest level of training possible. With the United States, generally speaking, considered to be the wealthier of the two countries, that might give the Navy SEALs a slight advantage in terms of the advanced weapons and the gear their troops would have access to. But given the similarities in skill sets and training received by them and the Russian Spetsnaz operatives, any slight differences in gear would almost be negated. Both have access to weaponry that's among the deadliest currently available. During a direct engagement, having something like an AK-74 or an AK-12 in your hands doesn't make you much more or less effective than someone wielding an M4A1 or an MK-17 SCAR-H. While it's true some firearms have advantages, like better accuracy or more stopping power, in the end, the efficiency and reliability of any weapon all comes down to the skills of the person using it, rather than its technical specifications. So in a fight between the SEALs and Spetsnaz, that would likely be the determining factor, the skill of the individual soldiers. After all, different Spetsnaz units exist to serve different purposes. Even though they've trained to operate in a number of different environments and varying missions, the SEALs would very likely perform differently against every different Spetsnaz variation. Up against most of the Spetsnaz units formed internally within the Russian Army, the Navy SEALs could have the upper hand, given their equipment and training differ from that of standard soldiers. But better equipped Spetsnaz operators like those working under the FSB or the GRU are some of the most ruthless and feared in the world. 
and they have the training and equipment to back up that reputation. However, given the performance of Russian special forces in Ukraine to date, there are serious questions about their basic competency and effectiveness. While you regularly hear about daring Ukrainian special forces raids, such as the one that destroyed an S-400 battery in Crimea and opened the skies up for devastating missile attacks in Sevastopol, no similar stories of Russian operations are making their way out of the country, even from pro-Russian sources. This likely means that even Russia's best aren't quite meeting the mark. When it comes down to it, there is at least one similarity that both share. Both the US Navy SEALs and the Spetsnaz are special forces comprised of some very dangerous individuals who have been trained to make the world a cleaner place, at least from the perspective of their respective countries. There's a new monster in the waters of the Pacific, and it's taken the US Navy by surprise. Not projected to enter service for some time yet, the US Navy was surprised by the speed with which China is finishing construction on its latest nuclear-powered submarine, the Type 096. Known as a lackluster submarine power, the Type 96 will strengthen the submarine portion of the Chinese nuclear triad and be the first true modern offering, and it's got the US military planners seriously concerned. Historically, China has not been a great submarine power, with the tech behind these stealthy machines being jealously guarded by every major power. This is the one piece of technology the Chinese weren't able to either steal from the US or the Soviets, or reverse engineer from purchased Soviet hulls. Lacking the maturity and expertise of Western shipbuilders, China's efforts to create a capable submarine fleet have been subpar. In the 1980s, China began development on the Type 93 nuclear-powered attack submarine as a replacement to their first-generation Type 91. The second generation of nuclear sub is now the most modern of China's submarine fleet, albeit with significant upgrades. Known as the Type 93A Shang-2 class, it's complemented by the Jin class Type 94A, which serves as China's nuclear deterrent armed with 12 nuclear ballistic missiles. But these subs are built on old Soviet nuclear sub technology traded by the Russians in the early 1990s when they ran into significant cash troubles. Technical support and key design elements were provided by the Rubin Design Bureau for Marine Engineering the Central Naval Agency of Russia. From this starting point, China built the Shang class, which featured modern improvements over the old Russian designs. In recent years, though, China's been building on lessons learned and incorporating new technologies to build a more competent and deadly submarine fleet. China is already deploying its newest conventional submarine, the Type 39C Yuan class, to Taiwan's territorial waters. This is an air-independent propulsion design, which utilizes diesel engines to charge banks of electronic batteries and then cruises under battery power. Diesel submarines are both incredibly lethal and incredibly vulnerable. They operate by electric power drawn from massive banks of batteries, typically giving them an endurance of days. Because there's no engine or nuclear reactor with moving parts operating while submerged, diesel subs are notoriously difficult to locate while running on electric power. However, when that charge runs low, diesel subs are forced to surface and extend snorkels so they can run a diesel engine and recharge their batteries without asphyxiating their crews. This is when a diesel sub turns from predator to helpless prey, as the extended snorkels become a dead giveaway to a surface radar. New snorkels feature radar-absorbing materials, but high-resolution radars can still spot them at long ranges, and sensors known as diesel sniffers can lead a warship directly to the location of a charging diesel submarine. Not to mention that while near the surface, any airborne anti-submarine assets will easily spot the big submarine. Air-independent propulsion technology aims to dramatically increase the endurance of vulnerable diesel submarines by allowing them to make full use of their extreme stealth. AIP comes in four varieties. The first is closed-cycle diesel engines. These types of boats store a supply of oxygen, typically in liquid form, aboard the submarine. This oxygen is then pumped to the engines, which it uses for combustion. However, in order for the engines to run safely, the oxygen is mixed with an inert gas like argon that simulates real atmospheric oxygen. The exhaust gas is then chilled and scrubbed to extract leftover oxygen and argon before the rest of the waste gas is simply discharged into the seawater. Despite it being the cheapest of AIP options and in service since 1960, the technology is not in wide use today due to the need of stored liquid oxygen on board. The highly reactive gas is extremely prone to starting fires, as the Soviets found out during the Cold War. Closed-cycle steam turbines are a second AIP alternative that improves on the core concept of closed-cycle technology. Operated only by the French, this method combusts ethanol and oxygen under high pressure to generate steam, which is in turn used to run a turbine a similar system to what we see in nuclear-powered submarines. The combustion occurs at such a high pressure that carbon dioxide can then be expelled directly into the sea at any depth without using a compressor. 
This AIP alternative has one huge advantage, a very high power output which means a very fast submarine outrunning even nuclear powered boats. However, it's a very inefficient process which means oxygen consumption is extremely high. The system that powers this technology is also said to be extremely complex, which is not something you want to hear if your sub breaks down hundreds of miles from shore. Due to the high cost, low efficiency, and extreme complexity, global navies opt for the next two technologies instead. Stirling cycle engines are a closed cycle engine concept that has a working fluid, a substance such as the steam in nuclear-powered submarines which drives the shaft, permanently contained within the system itself. The working fluid is heated which in turn moves the pistons and runs the submarine engine. A generator coupled to the engine provides electricity and recharges the onboard batteries. Typically liquid oxygen is used as an oxidizer and regular old diesel fuel is used to run the engine, with the exhaust scrubbed and released into the seawater. Compared with other AIP technologies, Stirling cycle engines are much cheaper and less complex, and run on regular old diesel making them cheap to refuel. They're also much quieter than closed cycle steam turbine engines, but a lot noisier than fuel cell diesel submarines. The submarine is also limited to a dive depth of 200 meters while the engine is engaged. Fuel cell AIP tech is the most popular and widely used today. Fuel cells convert chemical energy into electricity, typically by using a fuel and an oxidizer. Hydrogen, the fuel, is typically allowed to react with oxygen, with the chemical energy producing electricity, while water and heat are released as byproducts. Currently, Germany is the world leader in fuel cell technology and supplies most of the world's demand for AIP diesel submarines. However, France is working on a next-generation fuel cell diesel submarine, and India is looking to integrate the technology into its own subs. Fuel cells have almost no moving parts and thus allow for an incredible level of stealth. They can also achieve a fuel efficiency as high as 80%, giving their submarine great endurance. Hydrogen fuel cells also have the added bonus of creating no byproducts except for water and heat, making them environmentally friendly. The only major drawback to the technology is that they are very technologically complex and very expensive, limiting who can afford them. While details remain scarce, it's believed that China's Yuan class is using a Stirling engine, which has interesting implications as to how China plans to use this new attack submarine. America famously operates an all-nuclear submarine fleet, and that's because America seeks to hold every potential enemy at arm's length. This is key to the U.S. success throughout the 20th and 21st century. The ultimate goal is and always has been to ensure the homeland remains completely untouched in time of war. Diesel submarines have greatly limited range due to their need to carry fuel stores, while nuclear submarines are limited only by how much food you can pack on for the crew. Air-independent propulsion technology can greatly increase a diesel sub's range while removing its vulnerability as the sub no longer needs to snorkel, but it's still ultimately limited in range by the amount of fuel it can carry, and refueling your submarine halfway across the Pacific is going to be a dead giveaway to the enemy. Thus, the option to field a new diesel AIP submarine means that China's looking to address regional, not global concerns, namely Japanese, Australian, Taiwanese, and American forces in its own backyard in a potential struggle over Taiwan. Operating only a few hundred miles from friendly ports, AIP is an excellent choice for the Chinese Navy, coming in at a fraction of the price of a US nuclear submarine while enjoying the benefits of extreme stealth. Nuclear submarines may have unlimited endurance, but they're also notoriously noisy as the nuclear reactor is constantly operating and can never be shut down. This problem has forced the US to spend billions on silencing technology, and today tracking a US nuclear submarine has been described as it being easier to simply listen for silent spots in the ocean. Outside of crashed UFO technology and the true origin of Bigfoot, silencing technology for its nuclear fleet is one of the US's most closely guarded secrets. Cost matters in a war between the US and China, because China knows that it has a considerable disadvantage in the undersea realm. A decade ago, Chinese submarines were described by sonar operators as sounding like the contents of a kitchen drawer bouncing around the bed of a truck going 40 miles per hour down a dirt road. Today, it's made leaps and bounds in silencing its notoriously noisy boats, prompting some US admirals to comment on the improved capabilities observed by American patrols in the Pacific. But the US is the old dog in the undersea game, even if it let its ASW capabilities seriously atrophy after the Cold War, leading to some embarrassing kills during exercises against friendly diesel subs in the early 2000s. Thus, China expects to lose a significant number of subs in a fight against the US and its allies. And having a submarine that costs less than half of a US nuclear-powered attack submarine becomes an incredibly attractive option, even if you're being forced to sacrifice the capability to project power globally. 
It's incredibly difficult to determine just how much of a threat the Yuan class is, though, given the extreme secrecy that shrouds any nation's attack submarines. What we do know we can infer from current developments, projected needs, and observations of the submarine itself. The sail, for example, has been redesigned from previous models, implying a greater need for surface or near-surface stealth. This could be because of very long transit times in and out of Chinese ports, or because the submarine will have a strong focus on the insertion of Special Forces troops. We also know that the aft casing has been extended to contain a towed sonar array, a typical feature of modern submarines that allows them to operate a sonar safely from a distance. Since enemy submarines are looking for the noise of your own sonar, towing it several hundred meters behind you is a safe way of using it actively while not getting yourself blown up. This capability has long been missing from Chinese submarines and makes the Yuan class a significantly more dangerous ASW opponent. The whole of the Yuan class also appears to be using a new type of anechoic coating, and it's missing the rubber tiles visible on earlier models on top of the hull. Rubber tiles are still used along the bottom of the boat though, and the new coating visible on the top does appear to be rubberized but slightly uneven. This could signify ongoing manufacturing troubles for China, which has lagged significantly behind the West in extreme precision manufacturing or advanced tooling machines such as the 5 or 7-axis tool machines. Similar lack of high precision can be seen on the J-20 Stealth Fighter, which has noticeable gaps in panels which increase its radar signature. The Yuan class is likely primarily an anti-ship platform, which makes sense for a conflict in the South Pacific. This differs from the US, which primarily uses its attack subs to hunt for other submarines, only then turning their weapons on surface targets. Weapon stowage is believed to number at around 18 and could include the latest YJ-18B supersonic anti-ship cruise missile, which would make the sub a significant threat to the US Navy surface vessels. However, whether it carries the YJ-18Bs or the older YJ-82 conventional anti-ship missiles, the Yuan will still need to link up with offboard assets to effectively target surface ships, rendering it vulnerable to kill chain disruption. On top of anti-ship missiles, the Yuan will carry standard dual-purpose anti-ship and anti-submarine torpedoes, but seems to also be equipped to conduct mining operations. This falls in line with the People's Liberation Army Navy's plan to create an anti-access area denial strategy that slows down U.S. response in any war in the South Pacific. The Yuan class represents an evolving threat from China's underwater forces and a significant leap forward in submarine technology. By 2025, the DoD predicts that China's massive shipbuilding industry will have fielded 42 operational Yuans, which is bad news considering that this is exactly when many predict the US and China will be going to war. For the time being, it's widely believed that America's Virginia class remains the world's best attack submarine, but losses will be inevitable and the fate of the Pacific might be decided by who can afford to replenish their naval assets the fastest. Here, China has both the cost and production advantage, which should send alarm bells ringing at the Pentagon. It's said that the greatest heroes hail from humble origins, and when World War II exploded into the history books, surely nobody would have predicted that a dentist would become one of the world's most elite soldiers. But it's true, today we're taking a look at the orthodontist who became the first US Navy SEAL. U.S. SEALs are world-renowned as some of the best special forces operators in history. Fielding the most advanced and often highly classified equipment anywhere in the world, SEALs are routinely sent to do impossible missions in impossible places, trained to operate in the sea, air, and land. Hence the name SEAL. SEALs are deadly warriors who can reach any target anywhere it chooses to hide. From counterterrorism to direct action missions, SEALs are flexible enough to be sent on a hostage rescue mission one day and to blow up an enemy dam the next. To meet the stringent requirements of the Navy SEALs training program, you must not only be physically tough, but mentally tough as well, with an iron will and an attitude that doesn't know the meaning of the word quit. Yet these legendary warriors can trace their lineage down to a single man widely recognized as the first unofficial American SEAL. Navy Lieutenant J.G. Jack Taylor's service in World War II preceded the official formation of the U.S. Navy SEALs by almost 20 years, and yet he is the first U.S. commando to have been trained and to have actually operated on the sea, air, and land. As an orthodontist in Hollywood, California, Lieutenant Taylor answered his nation's call to arms. After the surprise Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, a trained boater, Taylor assumed that he would become an instructor teaching boat handling skills to U.S. and Allied soldiers. But during his initial training, he certified on the Lambertson Amphibious Respiratory Unit, a predecessor to modern scuba gear. Having qualified on the water lung, as it was known, and with top marks for intelligence and physical fitness, the Office of Strategic Services was quick to recruit him. 
Established in June 1942, the Office of Strategic Services was America's response to the asymmetrical warfare units of Germany, Japan, and Britain, seeing a need for a different kind of war, a much dirtier type of warfare, that would take place behind enemy lines. The United States formed the OSS and gave it a degree of autonomy from the rest of the military, famously recruiting American playboys, socialites, and business elite. The OSS sought out operators who were not just physically fit and could take orders, but who knew their way through social situations and could blend in behind enemy lines. For the majority of the war, the rest of the US military would deride the OSS as a bunch of playboys fooling around at war. But the reality is that OSS operators faced incredible danger and were directly responsible for many of America's greatest successes during the war. OSS operators were trained in intelligence gathering, demolitions, sabotage, and even in recruiting and organizing resistance movements. They had to be able to swim through choppy seas, parachute behind enemy lines, and evade enemy patrols through the wilderness. They brought with them a bag of dirty tricks, which could be used to sabotage enemy railway lines, the engines of motor vehicles, or even poison and assassinate high-priority individuals. As was famously said of them, OSS operators were experts in ungentlemanly warfare. Upon being recruited to the OSS, Taylor was assigned to the first underwater swimmer group, but was soon redirected to become the chief of the Office of Strategic Service Maritime Unit. The MU, as it was known, was responsible for infiltrating agents and supply resistance groups by sea, conducting maritime sabotage, and developing specialized maritime surface and subsurface equipment and devices. Its operators could be ferrying secret agents past enemy patrols into hostile territory one day and be swimming under the hull of a battleship and attaching an underwater limpet mine to the bottom of the mighty ship the next. Often these small teams of expert divers, boaters, and swimmers could do more damage than several destroyers together could. From September 1943 to March 1944, Taylor found himself operating in the Mediterranean. Here, Germany had been forced to send forces to aid its ally, Italy, after the Italians suffered defeat after defeat to Britain's African forces. With the Allies holding key bases in the Mediterranean, the Axis powers waged a brutal campaign against what they feared would become an Allied toehold, which could lead to an invasion. To support the war, Taylor and his men helped deliver spies to their targets along the Greek and Balkan coasts, as well as weapons, explosives, and other supplies to partisan forces behind enemy lines. As the Germans devastated Allied supply convoys, Taylor and his men became critical in quickly delivering critical supplies to Allied forces, his small, agile boat proving difficult to spot from the air. For three months, though, Taylor left the sea behind to personally lead a team of commandos behind enemy lines in central Albania. There, Taylor and his men carefully scouted out and reported on the location of enemy fortifications, supply dumps, and artillery positions. He would also shadow major troop movements and relay their plans via radio. Aware that a team of enemy spies was in the area, the Germans hunted for Taylor and his men time and again. Yet on three separate times, Taylor and his men narrowly avoided the German ambushes. For his daring feats behind enemy lines, Taylor would be nominated for the Army's Distinguished Service Cross. But being a sailor was instead awarded the Navy Cross. After D-Day and the successful landings at Normandy, the Allies began a push toward Germany itself. In Italy, Allied forces fought a brutal campaign north, pushing back the Germans inch by inch. The whole way, Allied forces were helped by partisan groups who had often been fighting the Germans for years behind enemy lines. Yet, as the Allies prepared to break out of Italy, military planners realized that they had no contact with partisan groups in Austria. In order to break Germany's grip on Europe, the Allies would need the help of these freedom fighters, but making contact would be an extremely dangerous undertaking, and exactly the type of mission the men of the OSS were perfect for. Personally picked to lead a four-man team into Austria, Taylor was tasked with making contact with Austrian partisans and gathering intelligence on German troops and fortifications. Parachuting into Austria would fulfill Taylor's air requirement of a Sea Air Land Commando, and he became the first US soldier to conduct commando missions in all three domains. However, the mission ran into trouble almost from the get-go, with the pilots unable to drop the team's radios and other major equipment after the men had jumped. Accompanied by three Austrian corporals liberated from a POW camp, one of them became extremely ill in the first few days following the jump, and Taylor was injured on the jump. Nonetheless, the team gathered what equipment they could and began their mission to collect intelligence and make contact with friendly Austrian partisan forces. The team would photograph many German defensive positions and made contact with and ascertained the loyalty of various anti-German groups. As the mission neared its end, they formed a network of supporters who could be counted on to aid the Allies when the major push into Europe began. 
Yet, without a radio to communicate their critical information, the team was forced to attempt to slip through German lines and into Italy to rejoin Allied forces. On the night before their escape attempt, Taylor and his men were ambushed at their safe house and captured by German forces. Delivered to the Gestapo, the Germans slapped and kicked Taylor around, trying to force him to admit that he was a civilian and not a US officer, which would have exempted him from the Geneva Convention protections. Taylor steadfastly refused to make the false confession, and eventually he was transferred to a holding cell and taken to a new interrogation. There, his interpreter would end up being an undercover Allied agent who was so visibly shaken at recognizing Taylor that in a later report Taylor would say that he was afraid the agent would blow his cover. The German commander asked about Taylor's mission and then asked why the Americans were bombing them when they had never once launched an attack against the US. Taylor quickly pointed out the fact that the only reason the Germans hadn't bombed the US was because they were thankfully out of range. Then the commander asked him how long he had thought the war would last, and Taylor said six months, to which the commander agreed. However, when he asked him who would win and Taylor said the Allies, the commander laughed. In less than a year, the Germans would surrender. After four months of interrogations, Taylor was eventually transferred to the infamous extermination camp of Mauthausen. After the guards discovered that Taylor was an American officer, he initially received humane treatment, even being offered cigarettes and brandy. Yet when he refused to cooperate with his interrogators, he was stripped of his legal status as a captured POW and instead labeled as a political prisoner. This was a violation of the Geneva Convention, but allowed the Germans to dispose of him as they wished. His uniform was taken away and he was forced to dress in civilian clothing. He was beaten several times and witnessed numerous executions of other prisoners. During his stay at Mauthausen, Taylor was twice scheduled for execution, but the first time a friendly worker in the camp's political office spotted his execution order in a stack of orders for other prisoners. The worker snuck Taylor's order away and secretly burned it. The German camp officers, however, eventually realized that Taylor was still alive when he very much shouldn't have been, and scheduled a second execution. Before the date arrived though, the German guards fled the camp as the American 11th Armored Division approached and liberated it. Just a few hours after liberation, Taylor was being filmed by an American film crew who was documenting the various prisoner and extermination camps. He gave the filmmakers a detailed account of daily life for the prisoners, as well as the inhumane and cruel actions of the guards. At the Nuremberg trials after the war, Taylor would testify as a key witness against the German war criminals, ensuring their sentencing for crimes against humanity. Lieutenant Taylor preceded the official establishment of the U.S. Navy SEALs by almost 20 years, and yet his courage and actions behind enemy lines set the standard for what would be expected of future SEALs. While he may never have officially been one, each new American SEAL can trace back their warfighting heritage to the man who was the first American commando to operate from the sea, air, and land. Think you have what it took to be a World War II commando? Let us know in the comments. And if you liked this video, make sure you watch our other video, The Insanely Crazy Story of a Tiny Soldier. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more great content.